So I'm made in the liquor. So liquor. Yeah, but before we start in the, about some eight minutes to start officially, uh, it is good to get you thinking about why you are here. I'm sure you are aware that you are here for a career, you know, counseling, the career guidance, and even how to get some opportunities as well as a student. I have been here for three good years. I've not seen this before, or either I've not attended a conference like this. Speaking to my career, I was a, I, I had my diploma here, and I am now a, a degree student of public relations. You know, public relations. So emphasis. <laughs> Emphasis on what public relations. I have never seen any, uh, any guest or dignitary to come and address why I should offer or why I should take a career in public relations. My individual intent to come to GID is to come here and uh, become a journalist. Yes, I was saying from that from that I don't want TV. Uh, and I was like, I want to be on TV and also be reading. Yeah. But until I got here, I don't even like TV anymore. <laughs> yes, I don't want to be on TV anymore. I don't even want to be on radio. Yes. After, you know, getting the diploma. It's not that I don't like journalism anymore, uh, uh, the job. But now I want to be at the back of uh, the TV and the radio and, you know, do the wonderful words from now. Do this do it. From now, you're welcome. And thank you so much for... One of the beautiful things is that I've never seen an ambassador on this campus in a conference like this. Wow. Yes. Big round, big round, big round. Yes, it's free. It's free. Today, I'm, I'm, even though I perform as a poet in presidential gatherings, but I am privileged to say that I and Lee can we are emceeing a diplomatic what, gathering. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the ambassador of Suriname, uh, in our midst, Her Excellency Fidelia Grand Galon. Her Excellency, you are welcome to the Government of Journalism, the premier communication of West Africa. Yes, this is where we learn how to speak, how to do journalism. And this, fortunately, you have a journalist, a uh, world journalist, who completed this very school. In this whole uh, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. So, it's good to have you, Excellency. Welcome. It's good to be here, too. We have to acknowledge our sponsors, or those who actually raised this uh, conference to this level we see today. Uh, one of the beautiful bands that I associate myself with, because of their talent, the color red. I'm a votarian. Do not, you know, do away with that. And, and the perception is that votarians like color red. Yes. No, I don't like color red because of it. Uh, I'm a votarian. But I like it because I am a socialist. I have that, you know, that sort of freedom fighting within myself. And so if you want uh, to be a, uh, an independent individual, you should bank with APSA. You should be able to bank with APSA. And uh, they have some beautiful policies that you can, you know, engage yourself in. And by 25 years, you should have, you should be independent and be, you know, swiping out your cash like that. All right? Yes, even if you have 25 cities, you can go to KFC and buy food. Swipe the card. It's your own card. No one cares about that. Okay? So, unfortunately, what they are doing is that they are even registering. Uh, if you want to open an account, just... Uh, uh, they are at the gate or at the entrance of this very conference uh, room. Just get to them and register for yourself. We, we cannot even talk about everything without honoring the very person who put this event together. Right? The name of that person is Job. Uh, or Job or Job. Uh, I prefer Job because he wants to wear. And then because of Job, uh, Job or Job Pabena, Pabena Laboja the lead organizer for the career factor. Give it out to him. Give it out to him. The student putting this together is very, very expensive. Very expensive. The desire of a certain... Uh, that's okay. Okay. 
it's very expensive because you have to go around, even transportation and crowd today is challenging. You can even kill you. Uh, as young men, I know it's somewhere far from uh, Abita Accra. He's got no family here. And he eat Gary when, you know, we are so. Yes, we all eat Gary, so there's no problem. It's from what you need to And trying to organize a program in Accra is very difficult. You don't have family here to take care of you. So you have to do all that yourself. Job, thank you so much for putting up this together. And uh, I am grateful to be your MC today. And also, we are grateful for even, yes. As you sit here, is the reason why I'm talking too much, and because I'm seeing some beautiful and handsome faces around. Without that, I, I don't speak, you know. Uh, yes, if I don't see beautiful things around or handsome people, it's, it's difficult, it will, be, or it will be very difficult for me to come and stand here and just talk to the, 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 the seats over here, right? But because of your presence, you know, one of the most important elements why I should speak, why this program is organized, is for you to even get impartation, right? You have some impact, you have some sort of uh, 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 encouragement, and some sort of go get, you know, uh, ideas. That is why I'm also here speaking. You are the important person we invited here. Ladies and gentlemen, give it out to yourself, give it out to yourself. Give it out to yourself. We will be having the minister of the deputy minister for foreign affairs in our midst shortly, and uh, that is Honorable Thomas Mbomba. He is the deputy minister for foreign affairs and regional integration. It is a great thing to have, you know, great men, and that's why I said you are in a conference of what diplomats. As you are here, Charlie can decide to say you are you are in a, a, a you know. Southern America, because Ambassador is here, and this room is uh, or virtually turned towards Southern America. So you can start to speak any language on this page. Yes, speak English, speak English, or don't speak any local language. But if you must, you have to speak it, right? Yes. But the room is currently a Southern American room, and all of us here automatically. Ambassador, I hope before you leave here, you give us a visa to your country. Yes. Me, I have my passport here, so I can get visa to come to your country. I would like um, Nathan, my my special MC, who is not, she's going to assist me to start officially the program. I will back. Thank you. Your response is not being encouraged. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Once again, I welcome you to the career factor. Um, thank you for being here, even though we are starting a bit late. Thank you for your patience and hanging around for us to start. The career factor is a job covenant of border initiative designed to bring together industry players to orient students on the need to develop a career for themselves before leaving school. The theme for the reading edition is the career factor approaches to professional development. So I hope by the end of this seminar conference, you are going to pick a thing or two from uh, key industry players who will come and then um, help us shape our career. Like Sefa, she said, when I was coming to GIJ, I remember during my time, you would fill the form and then you'd have to state why the school should select you. It wasn't as easy as you know you have it this day. And I wrote that I want to become um, a journalist. And like Sefa she said, we all wanted to be on TV, we all wanted to be on radio. And when I was in school in level 200, I had the opportunity to work with National Commerce at the group. And it was a production campaign. From 2017, I fell in love with working from the back. I didn't want to be at the front anymore. I wanted to be the back. Because the work we put in to make productions come up, you you feel you feel fulfilled at the end of the production and then you clap for yourself and you tap yourself on the shoulder. And sometimes I'm amazed at the productions we come up with. So I just want us to prepare our mind. And I always 
themselves to them that I take over as that. Don't come to GIJ with the mindset that you want to be on TV, you want to be on radio. There are lots of opportunities out there. Only if you allow yourself. Because it's true. The industry is true. So you have to find it. People are doing podcasts now, blogs, blogs, and it's fetching money. TikTok is fetching money, isn't it? People dance. They are trying to dance in the office. I couldn't. But people just dance. And then, if my brother is a musician. He released a song, they're ready for people to just dance for less than 30 seconds. And one person was charging $1,000 for just something that thing to do. That must be it. So you realize that there's a way to make money out there, not just being on screen. So I hope at the end of this seminar, we are going to pick a thing or two, and then we'll start thinking differently about why we came to GIG. All right. You class <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll call the lead organizer, Joe Pavel Aboja, to come give us a welcome address. Representative from the Office of the Dean of Students and representative from the Office of Career and Guidance Council of GIG. Invited guests, fellow students, ladies and gentlemen. I am glad to be here to welcome you to this day of the first edition, the Career Factor Program. I know that many of you are here just because you believe that this program is in line with your ambitions. And for that matter, you have come to at least get tips on how to make your ambitions a success. This program gives you access to industry players with the expertise in training and coaching. Today, you will be assisted to get in touch with your career passions and learn how to improve your professional and personal brand. If you are looking to get a head start on your career, then this program is a great way to do it. It is no news that jobs opportunities compared to the growing number of university graduates are limited. According to the Ghana Statistical Service, the unemployment rate is 13.9% as at the year 2022. The limited job space is not only the limitation, but connections, the outrageous demand for three to five year work experience, and other demands from minimum wage. How do we prepare ourselves for the job market, if this is the case? How do we groom ourselves at this early stage of our lives for a well-built career, just like our panelists have done for themselves? How do we become the hot kick of our fields, just like Pomelado is being sorted out everywhere? What do we have to do to stand out from our competitors. Remember, we are competitors here. Because if you apply for a job and they pick you and leave you, or they pick you and leave you, you have won. I have to look elsewhere. Sit back, prepare to learn. Unlearn and relearn as our guest speakers educate us here at the Career Factor. Thank you very much. God bless you. Unfortunately, I have to punish you because you, you come back. Uh, 
Indians, uh, since you are the one that invited our honorable people, you are in the best position to also introduce them to us. For me, I, I am I'm falling in love to be a diplomat. That's why I'm doing public relations in the first place. My next job is to take a career or study something related to international relations. Yes, I am I am gradually forming my ways out, and that is what I want to be. I want to be a diplomat. Her Excellency, I want to be like you when I grow up. Job, please uh, give it up for Job to come again to give us a brief about our invited guest, Jen. So, I was there some few days ago and somebody contacted me that uh, saw a flyer going around and saw some speakers and it looks like it is well thought through. How did, how did I come up with that? I was like, who? I don't even know how I did it. And I'm not alone in this. When I was walking down with the ambassador, she made some comments uh, that two heads are better than one. That's the only way I can say it. But I believe when she mounts the podium, she will definitely say it how they say it at soon now for you to understand. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't continue without thanking enough the Tepui for being the brain behind some of this increase. <laughs> All right, so I will start with uh, the guest that we have here. As many of you may be aware, Mr. Pamlago, I like to call him like that. He right? doesn't want to be called Mr. He wants to be fresh for, forever. That will not happen whilst I'm here, by the way. He's a broadcast journalist. He has been a student of this institute. He has worked with many media houses, including multimedia, and currently with TV3, Media General, one of the biggest media houses in Ghana. And, <laughs> and he is currently one, uh, the, one of the hosts or the anchor for new, midday, midday news. So if you like watching the afternoon news, you definitely see him there. And if you love documentary so much, yeah. there is one of the people you have to look up to. He does the, that so well in star. So please, I'm glad to meet you, Kamlado. Thank you. Kamla, thank you for coming. Great. Well, there are other speakers that I was to acknowledge before the ambassador. But since they are not here yet, I'm told the minister is on his way and will definitely be here. All right, the ambassador is a politician. <laughs> if I say a politician, I would explain. What a politician in Ghana here, she's a diplomat representing her country. Suriname. As many of you, you may not be aware of that country. Um, it's one of the Caribbean countries in South America. If you've heard of Cuba and Jamaica and all, they are, they are all in South America. So I know a little about that country, that they have some similarities just like we do here. We have some similarities. They are one of the largest producers of, uh, they have a uh, gold, some of these natural resources that we have here, they also do have some. They have uh, plantations and all that. And I was, in fact, I didn't want to mention this here, but <laughs> I think I have to mention. Yes, I was, uh, I was fortunate to have dinner with the ambassador once a few months or weeks ago, where we spoke a lot about 
they can't hear it. As I'm standing here, I can tell you that I'll be in that country one day. So please, Ambassador, it's all about me. Ambassador Fidelia Grant, the loan. We are grateful that you've honored our invitation. Thank you. I hope you enjoy this program. Thanks. Thank you very much. We will be having others coming and towards the front. The MCs will be there to that. Thank you. Thank you for that for her. <laughs> she has agreed to share the career factor, the legal edition of the career factor. Thank you, Madam, for honoring our invitation. Um, as we are waiting for the other guests to come, uh, we would let the guest speaker here, who is seated here, to start as we for that guest to come. Um, as Joe already said, Kamala Abdul is a multi for what to say this is a multiple award-winning broadcast journalist. Emphasis on the multiple <laughs> award-winning broadcast journalist. He's an author, he's, a, he's an MC, and then he's an alumnus of this institute, Ghana Institute of Journalism. So we'll call on Komla Adam. He's come to take us through um, MCing and intention, a step to developing a career. Shall we start for Kamala? Thank you very much. I was wondering how I was going to be able to walk from that side to this side because my head is all over the place. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here, Your Excellency. I appreciate that you are here. Um, I did not prepare any speech because I am not such a good speech writer. But when I saw Job span here reading all the big English he was reading, I was like, what is all of that? What is he saying? How does that put money in my pocket while we're sitting here? But that's just by the way. So, I want to begin by sharing an experience with you. I was here two separate times. I was here between 2012 and 2014. And then I went and came back to 2014, 2016. Because I had to do my national service some, somewhere in between. So 2015, 2017, yes. So while I was here the first time, before I got into GIG, I had started writing for a sports website. Because while I was in senior high school, even though I was a science student, I was interested in other things but science. So I was interested in the sports stories. I would send the day student to buy newspapers, the 90 minutes newspaper at the time, which Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, they used to print them. So I'll send them, they'll buy them while they're on their way to school. I'll be on top of the sports, you know, news and stories happening. I'll be updating my people in class. And so from that point, I just thought that something apart from science was what I needed to do. Around that time also, my English teacher in school had also hinted to me that if it is possible, I should consider an arts-related subject of history. Because of course, the English was such a good subject for me, the social studies was fantastic, the reading subject biology was great because I could chew and pour, <laughs> you know. I, I was also in a debate society, so I could speak generally. So I, I gave it a thought. My parents were not exactly happy about me switching. They wanted me to stick with the science. And these are things our parents keep doing and they, they frustrate us. So they stick doing that. I, I don't think it's a, it's a good thing. If your children want to do whatever they think they want to do, I think we should just allow them to do it. So my father insisted that I bought KMUST forms, you know, science, computer science, whatever. I also bought GIJ at the time. And you know, at the time, GIJ admissions almost was like the first that comes before the other you know, schools come. So I bought GIJ. I had spoken to somebody who was already in GIJ at the time. Because I wasn't too sure how the school was going to accept somebody switching from science to arts. Because in my mind, I was thinking they would consider all the arts students. And once 
they are exhausted in that list, then they can look elsewhere. But the singer told me, no, I should, I should put in the application. I mean, who knows? It could, it, could, it, could, it could happen for me. So I did. I got a diploma form. And GIG admissions came. And I told my parents that I had bought the form to so the application, you know, was successful, blah, blah, blah. We had to pay fees. They gave me money, I paid the fees. And I think a month after that, KNUST admissions also came. My parents were like, why, why did you rush? Because in my father's mind, science now never come. But in my mind also, I had other ideas. My parents were not happy, but getting into GIG, I knew I had to prove them wrong or to make a point that what I chose was what I really wanted to do and I would excel at it. So while I was in school, I'm not saying that when you're in school, don't do extracurricular stuff, by all means do it. But I was, because it was just two years, I just thought that I should focus on my books and then get the grades, really. So at the time I was writing for the newspaper, there was a World Cup around that time, I wrote for the, the online websites. So I was getting myself busy, really. GIG came, I went to school, First semester, I was trying to find my way around and find my feet. But second semester, of course, I, I grasped a few things. And during the graduation, when I was called out as the best student of the graduating class, my father walked up to me and gave me a hug, and I was like, okay. <laughs> I thought hey, we were not in this together. So that taught me that success has friends. Success will attract you know, people. Imagine if I did the diploma and I, I failed. I had like a, a third class. You would have said, uh-huh, we told you so. Do science, you did now. So while I was at GIG, I did internship at ETV Ghana, my first year. I did about six months at ETV Ghana. I don't know if ETV still exists, but yes. That's why I started my TV career proper, where I was going on assignments, you know, I was writing stories. And from there, I did national service at Armed Forces Radio for one year. Also, that's why I gathered my radio experience. While I was in doing the, the national service, I was applying myself. So because I've been listening to a lot of radio, in my mind, I knew how to do all the programs on radio. So when we go to Armed Forces Radio, there was free way for us to do what we really wanted to do. So we're emulating City and Joy FM on Armed Forces Radio. We'll listen to their stories, we'll write them, we'll go and present them just like what we we'll listen to the people on Joy and City FM doing. I thought it was exciting. I mean, there were no uh, inhibitions, if, if you like. Even though we're restricted to doing just Armed Forces related stories because of Armed Forces, you know, radio station. But it gave you some kind of leverage. It gave you an experience how to speak in the microphone, on how to use the console, how to write stories, because we're also writing stories for publication in the Armed Forces um, quarterly newspaper at the time. And also speaking in public, which is what we have been taught in school, but it was an opportunity for you to actualize all of that. So after national service, I did other things. I went to do I went to manage, you know, uh, an eatery for some time. I was selling pie and you know, pastries. When I was doing my top up, I used to take all of those to campus. And before I go to class, I'll go around and sell sprinkles and samosa before I get to class. They were delicious, I have to say. And, and so everybody liked them. And if it doesn't finish, I don't go to lectures because they have to be set hot. Those of you who like your pastries, you know that the sprinkles and samosa have to be set hot. I was doing this not because I, I wanted to do it, even though I was doing it because I wanted to raise funds to get up on my top up education. It was also an experience for me how to do marketing, basic marketing, you know, how to sell basic stuff. They will teach you the theory in class, which is all good and well. But you also have to get the experience of meeting people, speaking to them, getting them to buy into whatever you are selling. And after they buy it, the feedback they give you, you incorporate it in the next production that you do. So it was also part of it, the way I was learning on the job. While we're doing top up, some of my course mates were editors at Joy City at the time. They, they kept saying, why would you be selling Springboard when you are such a talented young man? Stop this, come and do internship at Joy. I thought I had arrived. I said, I won't do internship. Because, I mean, as of 2014, 20, let's say 2015, I didn't see myself starting again as an intern. 
you know, because in my mind, I have done ETV, I have done Armed Forces Radio, so I had some, at least some experience that could carry me through, at least the basic point. But they kept saying that no. The way the industry is, you have to grow into it. So you start as an intern while you're in school, you complete, they know you, they know your work, it's easy to employ you that way. Then say you walk into a Joy FM, fresh out of school with a CV and a certificate, and say, I want a job. They do not know you that much. So they cannot trust to give you employment immediately. I, I didn't give it a thought. I mean, I, I, I threw it off, off the board. A few months later, they, they raised the issue with me again. They said, no, Kamala, I think you should do this. And at Joy FM, our system is once you start as an intern, you do say three to six months, they know your worth. After school, it's easy for them to take you on. I wasn't too sure still. I was just not too sure. Because also I was making some money from selling the stuff anyway. So there was this day, I was told there was a, a meeting arranged between the programs manager of Joy FM at the time and myself. They didn't tell me it was an interview. So I just, I, I wear, wearing slippers and a shirt that I'm taking to lectures. I just went there and sat in front of the man. And the man said, What have you done before? And here's me. In my mind, I'm like, am I ready for this interview or I should just get up and walk? Because I was just not prepared. But I couldn't also pass up that opportunity and say, oh, I have no idea and walk out. It would be such a bad debt on me, really. So imagine the sports stories I've written before I got into GIJ and all of those small, small stories I've done at ETV. I showed it to them that, oh, I've done this before. I've been an intern here. These are the things I've done. And they asked me, so can you start as an intern tomorrow? It's too soon because I really was not prepared mentally to start an internship. So I told him to give me a week because at the time I also didn't have official clothes like shirt and tie, you know, shoes and belts that you go to work officially with. So I told him during the week I'll sort all of those out. So long story short, a week later I started work as an intern. Three months was done. They extended to three months, so six months. After six months, I was getting some stipends. So by the ninth month, I was employed at Joy FM. And in the first week that I started working, I was already on radio. And if you know how Joy FM is, they are very, usually very meticulous and, and they are careful about who they put on air. But I got there within one week, I was already on radio. Of course, because of the experience I had on radio, I wasn't new to the job. So that's where we started proper, proper, proper journalism. And six or so years down the line, we were here. Joy FM was amazing while I was there. They are very professional people. I appreciate all the things that they taught me while I was there. They are those elements that are helping me today in my new employment, which my bosses admit is a rare talent that people have. So the reason why I'm telling you all of this story is preparation for the opportunity. Imagine if I showed up in front of the manager at Joy and I said, Oh, say, um, I've, I've not done anything before. I, I will learn on the job. Nobody wants to give a newbie their medium or their space. They can't trust you with their space and their platform. It is not a playground that you're coming to now start learning how to do stuff. You must show up with something that they can build on, that they can help you train, you know, to become better at. There's also the other part I mentioned about doing this small, small writings. You people take it for granted, but it works. Because while I was at GIG, I was doing, I was writing small articles here and there. I remember the miscommunicator at the time when the ASO had an issue with the, during the pageant. They didn't give her an award when she won the, the pageant. They said they were going to give her a car and stuff like that. So one year on, they hadn't given her anything. So she spoke to me and I wrote a long article and I, I posted it on campus. Whenever I post the article, I'll find out somebody had gone to flip them and, and tore them apart. The next day, I'll paste it again. I realized that it's been torn apart. Then I, I saw that no, somebody is reading and watching and the content of the thing is either infuriating somebody enough to be tearing it down every time I wrote it. And it, it, it generated results. I mean, they finally gave her her, her, her her price worth and stuff like that. So I also have to tell you this, this moment that those little things you do while you're on campus, which is related to the job, will pay off. I understand these days you guys are very social media happy, everything you want to do on social media. One thing I have to say to you is you have to develop a digital footprint. 
Do we know what digital footprints are? Do we know? You do not. So imagine I was asked by my editor at TV3 to recommend one of you for employment. Not even as an intern, but for employment. And I mentioned a name, say, Sarah Kofi, to my boss. He will ask, who is Sarah Kofi? Quickly, we'll go and Google Sarah Kofi. And we find nothing. Okay, so who is this Sarah Kofi you are recommending to us? What is the person's you know, profile? What has the person done before? Then there's nothing there. You think my boss will, will, will take you on? Will want to take a gamble? In such a competitive media space, take a gamble on a nobody, quote unquote? Definitely not. So the digital footprint is just you being pretty much your LinkedIn accounts are there, you put stories on there, you put articles you've written on there, even on Facebook, where I live, because I'm always on Facebook. When I'm out of data, I feel like a part of me is, is, is missing because I can't be on Facebook. When I'm on Facebook, even in as much as we're you know, chilling, having fun with friends, etc., I use social media a lot because I have a lot of following. I project my stories, my documentaries, I projected a lot on social media. So if you Google me right now, you find so many things. I mean, so many things. Some are not related to the job, others are related to the job, but there's definitely something you find about me on there which should be a building point. If the editor or somebody wants to employ somebody, you know, for their media house. So the digital footprints is very, very important. It's all well and talk and doing all the drama that you guys love to do on TikTok and all of the places, but there must be something, something valuable, something that we can all refer to. Maybe a story that you've done before, an interview you've conducted before. There must be something. There must be something. That will set you apart from everybody else. It will give you, perhaps, a little advantage. If, if they are considering a number of people, that could give you some advantage. So it's very important to have a digital footprint. And you have to be conscious about it. There are some of you, even on Facebook, your profile names are really funny and, and, and creepy. Somebody who have Akosuya Kardashian, for example, <laughs> or Kim Sabia. Konchiwa, what is all that? Who is that? I mean, what is all that? We must identify you as who you are. There must be their personality. You know, all of those, some people use those as um, clones to do other stuff. So you have a, a main account and you have this other account that used to insult people and do all the terrible things. But there must be something professional that we can find when we log on to social media. So when we go on Instagram, we must find something, not just you posing and taking pictures with your butts that way. There must be something job related that must be on there. Yeah. Then I'll say again that, as we have said, when you're doing internships, apply yourselves. In our media house, for example, it's very difficult to employ interns because the interns that come around Sorry to say, they really just kind of walk about and go. But imagine you showed up as an intern in the newsroom and when we're having news meetings in the morning at 8 o'clock, you are basically giving an idea, raising your hand. Oh, I think this story, let's do it this way. Let's speak to Mr. A and B. Let's develop the story this way. We'll be better. It will sound better. It will look better. Which person in the newsroom will call you and say, go and buy me peanuts across the road? <laughs> but you showed up as, a, as an intern wearing skimpy clothes in the first place. You come and walk about with your handbag, with your nyash, just shake, 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 come and sit down. If you say do something, you don't want to do it. You drag your feet and say, oh, I'm not getting through to I'm not getting At the end of the day, you walk home and not do anything else. Nobody takes you serious that way. Imagine you showed up at work and you went to a corner adult sitting there who is busy prepared for his bulletin. And you're asking, okay, so how do you do this? Oh, this is how you do it. You are even observing, just observing, so that next time you can do something on your own. It will take you a long way. But if you just come to sit down, browse on the PC, put your ear, ear, earphones in your ears, listen to music half of the time, go home without learning or doing anything, no one will employ you or retain you in the company. So apply yourself during internships. Offer to go on locations with a journalist. A journalist is going on location to do a story. Oh, can I, can I tag along? Can I tag along quickly? So I see how you do it. You go with the person. You're observing how they are doing it, how they are gathering the stories, how they are conducting the interviews on location, and all of that. It will give you something. 
something. So by the end of three months, when you're leaving, at least you have something that you can write about when you are asked in the classroom. Are we okay? Am I making sense or I'm just talking to you? Are you sure? So you want to give me a hand? Yeah. My time is not up, I should still go ahead. Okay. So, um, the part about being an MC and voiceover artist. So, being an MC is, it can be easy and daunting at the same time, okay? When I was starting, I think the first event I, I emceed was, I think a family, a family member had a, a wedding or something. And I, I thought that because I was in journalism school, I could speak, you know. It was really, really, I had, there was a lot of tension. But I have to say, because it was a family event, it's easier that way to start. So you start that way. I mean, from that point, I was building confidence. I was taking, you take pictures, you take videos, you put them on Instagram, you put them on Facebook. Somebody sees it, they're like, oh, I think, can you also come and do my event for me? You start, you can do free events for the first few events. People who come to the events, listen to you, take your contact during the events because they think you're, you're good. They get an event, they invite you. So you start small. You start with your family. That's how I started. I don't know how others started. And it's not all the events that I do these days because I'm very busy. But the ones that I can do when I am able to do it, you do it to the best of your ability. Because you do not know who among the guests there also may have that big gig that can change your life. You know, so sometimes when we go to events, and we are emceeing, you are looking out to be the best representation of yourself at the time, so that a lot of people who are there for the events, who also in future may need your services, will contact you, and then, you know, you can take it from there. It's all about confidence, it's all about standing in front of people and speaking. Sometimes it's not only speaking English, because it can be boring speaking a lot of English to it, a group of people, half of which do not understand or speak English. So it's also good to vary the language when you are emceeing events. You, you, you gauge the guests. If the guests are predominantly Ghana speaking people, you don't speak Ghana, but you can try, you know, a few Ghana words here and there. You can invite somebody who speaks Ghana to help you do a few, you know, jokes. If it is tree, you, you slip in, you know, some tree here and there. So it, it, it gets everybody, you know, aligned. But if you go and stand there and speak a lot of English and grammar and half of the time nobody is understanding what you're saying, you would have wasted everybody's time. And nobody books you for their event because they pay a lot of money to have you to MC their events. And for voiceovers, I have not I have not been taught how to do voiceovers, but you learn on the job. And you learn by watching those who do it best. So you watch the BBCs of this world, you watch the CNNs, how they, they do their voiceovers, how they, you know, do that. There are something they call inflections, how you modulate your voice when you're reading the scripts. And sometimes you read it and you're listening and you're like, oh, I did this because it sounds really, really sweet. You have to be mindful of the language to an extent that you are taking consideration the pauses that you have to, you know, note when you're doing the voiceovers. For us, we do them on a regular basis in, in, in the office because once you go on assignment to do a story, you have to voice it, read it by yourself. So those who have good voices, read them. Those who have terrible voices, somebody has to read it for them. And so it's also an art. But what it, the, the good voice, as they say, is not enough. You must um, invest in polishing it. There must be some deliberateness about how to keep it smooth, how to ensure the process are right, the pronunciations very, very key because for an on-air person or a TV personality, you, the last thing you want to have is being on TV and mispronouncing everything. These days, there's um, a page on Instagram called Pronunciation Alerts. I hear it's a group of young people who have been monitoring the, the space, on-air personalities and their presentations. They've been catching us a lot when we make mistakes in pronouncing words. They'll catch the clip and put on Instagram and then tell you how it is pronounced rightly, so you know, they've caught us a few times. But you have to invest a lot in ensuring that the pronunciations are at point. Sometimes it may sound odd, but if it is the right thing, you mention it the right way. So this morning I was at GIJ, can I get a backup? 
This one has a GIJ, and then I was, I asked them to pronounce a few words just for trial purposes. So let me repeat it here, perhaps. Those who were in GIJ, I'm sure will know. So let me just write four of them. Um, On radio, those who are radio on TV or aspire to be on radio and on TV. Let me see someone pronounce the first one for me. Okay. Say that again. Anybody else? Okay. Apparatus. <laughs> what well, both of you are both of you are wrong, it's apparatus. It is the A for me. It's apparatus. You can check the, the British pronunciation. And then this one. Ex Gracia, yes. And then that one. Epitome. Yes, epitome. Yeah, I'm sure you're surprised. I mean, th these are things that growing up you pronounce them just anyhow, but because you are on TV, on radio, a lot of people are also learning from you, young people who are watching. So we, we aspire to be the best that we can. We cannot be 100%, but we strive to be the best that we can. So you are constantly listening to the BBC because we, are, we lean towards the British you know, pronunciation of words. So you are constantly listening to how they pronounce words. You are looking up to the British dictionaries to look out for the pronunciation of the words like that. And as I was telling the students this morning, when I pronounce the word and I am so confident that what I'm doing, what I'm pronouncing is the right thing, whatever anybody thinks about it, I do not care. So there are sometimes in the newsroom we'll be having conversations and I'll catch up in your wedding like, hey, so I'm like, no, it, that's just how it has to be pronounced. So you just have to stick to it that way. So it's been an interesting journey. I don't know if all that I've been saying has made sense so far, but that will be my little bit for now. Perhaps later on, I may come back if there are any questions. So I should take the questions now. We'll take the questions later. Okay. So thank you for your audience. I'm available for any questions. Thank you so much, Kamala Adam, for the insightful uh, education. Yes, uh, what I picked from the speech is that one data footprint. You need to make sure that you leave some digital footprint as a student of community. For me, when you send your friend request on Facebook or any other social media, and your profile picture is not well positioned, or it's somehow a selfie, I will not accept it. Yes. Because when you check my own profile, it is well taken like a passport picture that I can fix on a CD. Okay? So if you have what? A digital footprint. When you search your name on Google, we should find you. Some of us. If we should search our names on Google, no, we will not see it. And, and you keep saying that some family names are popular. That's because you have refused what? To, to create a digital footprint for, for your family. Me, my family, we are only two. But my surname, yes, when the woman is typing my surname, or my picking in my surname, or selfish, I'll be the only person to, it, to appear. It means that I have started leaving a digital footprint for my generation. If it happens that I'm no more and I'm given them, and they want to give them an opportunity somewhere and they type in their name, at least they will see something related to them. If your name is a jump or anything else, and you don't have any digital footprint, please start now. And also, apply yourself whilst doing intention. You should do that. I was, I was at the age one and I, I was an, I was intended. Mine was not intention, actually it was voluntary. So I went there purposely to report on election 2020. You know why? Because I want issues on election to appear on my on my CV. So I went there to report on election 2020 and I spent almost nine months there. Yes, definitely they will not give me money or they will not give me anything. But the way you position yourself in a new show, that is how come they want to approach you. 
Alright? I was never sent to even buy water before. Because I, 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 I'm always on top of charging the politicians, charging the manifestos. So I was basically interested in the, what the politicians have promised, or these parties promising this year, and what they have promised in their, in their previous manifesto. So I was basically on that. And, you know, even though I had no say, but I was given what, a desk to what, to prepare or to make sure I extract those promises and the ones that were not fulfilled, or they were not fulfilled, sorry. Okay, so if you promise that three SHS this year, and we are promising another three SHS today, so we, we weigh them. So at the time that the debate was, Mahama said he started three SHS, and Nanami said he is the founder of three SHS. Yes, we went back to the manifesto. We, we relate them, we realized that three SHS started somewhere in, the, uh, in coming to Mess time. Came down to Mahama, who started what? Uh, some, something related to three SHS. Okay? So, please, we are progressive three SHS. So as 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 we uh, from last teacher, apply yourself towards what the intention. Now I'm not interested in journalism. I want to be a PR person. But yes, I have I've gained some email, some skill as a, a communicator or a student journalist that I can go out there to also put on my CV and apply for a job. At least I have reported on what in 2020 as one of the busiest in the constituency. Right? Thank you so much for now. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, the chairperson of the, com uh, of the conference, or of this particular gathering. Uh, as those of us who are interested in diploma uh, diplomatic you know, issues, we will pay critical attention to, what, to every single word that she mentioned. Right? I know Amasawa is uh, she's a serious diplomatic young, uh, young woman, and she yes. She jumped from one uh, embassy to another. Amma is a diplomatic young woman that we have. Amma said, well, welcome. Yes, and we have uh, Hannah. Hannah, right? Yeah, Hannah, uh, she is the Miss uh, Agriculture, the 2020. Hannah, wait, wait for us, Miss Agriculture 2020. Thank you so much for coming. And we also have, in our midst, we have uh, Mr. Godfrey Aku Osei, the Assistant Registrar of GID, a career guidance and counseling expert. Say you're welcome. Thank you so much for coming on to so, Yes, if you have an issue, you come and talk about that. Me, I'm, I don't know whether I'm depressed or I'm hungry. Sometimes I feel like I'm depressed. I want to eat and I'm okay. So, by you, he's a specialist, you talk about that. But before that, let's invite Her Excellency Fidelia Grand Galon, Ambassador for Suriname to Ghana, to give us a moment. Well, good afternoon and all protocol observers, all important people. Thank you for having me here, Ghana. Uh, I'm not a politician. I never call myself a politician. It's a fight with my siblings every time we speak. They say you're a politician. I'm like, I'm not a politician. I am who I am. And that is how I present myself wherever I go. Most likely, even if it was in Suriname, never see me with a piece of paper when I do a speech because it will make me, I will be confused because I want to say the things as they are. I'm not English speaking, so if I make a mistake, when I pronounce the word, the journalists are here, don't laugh at me. I speak Dutch, but Dutch is not my language. I learned to speak Dutch in school. So there was a time that I was not speaking Dutch because I would make mistakes. And in the country they call Suriname, you don't make mistakes when you speak, especially Dutch, and 
Someone told me Dutch is the language that sounds. <laughs> I don't think so because when I speak Dutch, I love it now. But I did not speak Dutch. What language did I speak? That's why I love what you said. The language is very important. Know your public. Know what they speak. Know the context in which they look at you and they want to understand you. Sometimes they should want to understand what you talk about, what you say. If they don't want to understand, they will place you where they don't want to be. And in diplomacy, it is the language that makes you successful and the language that makes you fail. What do you say when you go somewhere? When I came to Ghana, my story is very complicated. I was born in a small village and none of us knew how to speak in, uh, Dutch. And we don't know how to speak English. That was worse. Uh, if you look at me, someone told me, when you walk in the streets of Ghana, one might think you're an Ashanti lady. And yes, it's true. But I don't know if it's true. People were forced 400 years ago out of Africa and I'm one of the descendants. And when they came there in a country called Suriname, some of them ran away from slavery because they didn't want to be slaves. They wanted to be human beings and live as how they knew how it was came from Africa. So when they ran away, they went in the forest far away and had a formation of tribes again. They founded chiefs and paramount chiefs, and they still use some words you know here in, in Africa. We still have some words. What people say that some words are ewe, some are, but some of them are ga, some of them are ashanti words. But what we know is that all ancestors came from Africa and there is a way of life that you need to have to protect yourself and that is the language again. And not only language, codes. You know when you speak to someone, you young people have some codes in English that your parents don't know. It's the same word you use but it's not the same meaning, right? When people say you look smart, maybe it doesn't even mean smart. That's how they thought, that, or how I thought it, how they taught it to me, please. <laughs> that is English. I'm thinking Dutch and I'm speaking in English. Uh, oh, they taught it to me in class, right? It's not that. But what you need to know is the code behind the sentences that we are using. Especially in diplomacy. They use a lot of codes. And if you don't know the code, you will go and embarrass yourself and embarrass your family, embarrass your country. You don't go as a diplomat and tell girls that it look good. You never say that. The country is always the best country you have been, you have ever been. They are the best people you have ever met. You never go to places and tell people, especially even in, here in Ghana, as a journalist, as you work for a company, go to another company and tell them, 
my company is better than yours. You never do that. How do you want to work with the people of this company if you think you're better than that? You need to know that people are people. We are human beings. Even if we are this world, we are human beings. In every job you do, you need to know the codes of success and the codes of failure. Am I successful? I don't know. It's only when I look back after I leave Ghana, and when I look back, if I have some friends here, and you know my language, then I know I'm successful. If they know my language, they know my country. Because there's a saying, the young man that brought me in here, that invited me, I told him something in my language. In Suriname, Dutch is the official language, but we speak many, many languages. Your language of origin. We have seven ethnic language among the Afro descendants. And uh, my language is a tribal language because I come from a tribe. And a tribe name looks like the name here you use in Ghana. It's Okanisi. Okanisi, I heard a young man named this Okanisi. I say, but that is my tribe name. So that is Okanisi. So the names like Kojo, we have them Kwaku, we have them Kwasi, we have them. All these names, my uncle's name, had the uncle name Afiba, I hear it's a northern. Uh, and I hear my mother's name is a Ewe name. And my daddy's name is a Grant name, word. So, my job is I hear, let's go. Well, my job, that was my mommy's name. My job. Right? And what do you have in this regard is that they relate, it's a code to relate to Africa. And when they didn't want to relate to Africa anymore, when they want to relate to the Netherlands, they changed the name to Dutch name. And then you don't want to hear anything about Africa because you're Dutch. So my mom's Dutch name was Thelma. And they, they didn't want to give me a maroon name because people would laugh at you. Like, if you have an African name, you're not educated. You're not well developed. That's a code again. That's why I started with codes. Diplomacy is codes. Journalism is code. It's all about codes and to relate to people. What I want to say today is that when you want to know the codes, you need to have friends. You need to make friends. That's a saying in my Maroon language. So my language is Okanisi, right? So when I speak, I will say something in the Okanisi language. It say Mila Taki Tutu Boom. Mila Taki Tutu Boom. Mila is aunt. And they say the aunt says pairing is good. Pairing is good. Boom is good. Tutu is two. Mila Taki. Tutu, boom. So never go alone, never walk alone. Don't think you're the best in your own. When they say you're the most popular journalist, don't think it's because you are the best. Someone, somewhere helped you to be where you are. To achieve, you cannot achieve alone. You can only achieve together 
with someone else. That's why a man needs a friend to go to. When time is hard for you in life, go to someone, ask for advice. Your mom can be your best advisor, but another friend can be your best advisor as well. Thank God I have it like that. <laughs> These are hats the African ladies made in Suriname with a meaning. This, this hat with cloth me a peacock. They want to show their pride. We don't have peacock in my country. We don't have elephant, but still whatever they do, they will have one animal of Africa involved. We have all the Anansi story. That is our story. We have songs in it. But these are codes as well to survive. If I want to survive, I need to know the codes of life. If I want to be a successful ambassador, I need to know the codes of Ghana to be successful. Not to come here and say, hey, listen, I come from the New World, so we know it better. Your Africans, like documentaries that we see, poverty is what we see most likely in Africa. Uh, instead, Africa is very wealthy with knowledge. Everything that we have here, I hear even the, uh, the telephone comes basically from Africa. When we walk with shoes here, it is an African man of Suriname called Jan Matsilidor. He found the machine to make the shoes in the United States of America. He's a black man and he was born in Suriname. And we all walk with it and we say, you see, nothing good can come out of Africa. Everything that is good comes out of this first world where God created human. I want to say here today, being an ambassador starts with yourself, right? You represent. All of us are ambassadors. I might be appointed ambassador, but I'm not a better ambassador than all of you here. You represent. Even if you don't represent your country yet, in another country, you represent your village. You represent your region. Remember, the way you behave will mark your region, will mark you as a husband, or as a wife, for people to say, I want a wife coming from the Volta region. It's the way you behave. Your cold behavior will tell them. So from now on, if you all want to come to Suriname, it's because of the cold that I present to you of Suriname, you would like to come to that country. You need no visa to come. It's accepted since July 1st. Wow. So everybody can come to my country without a visa requirement. You only need to register yourself online, and then you will get, get a voucher, and that's it. You don't need visa. And it's a country, it's large, and then I will stop here. It is large. 164,000 square kilometers, and we only inhabit 7% of it. 93% is forest, mountain, rapids, water, name it, clean, right? That is Suriname, and we speak like 24 different languages. 
If you want to see India, come to Suriname. My president name is Chandrika Santoki. Right. And, and I love you means Ham to K China. So when you go there, you want to tell her Ham to K China. We, we have Indonesia. We have Indonesia. They came from Java, Indonesia. They speak Javanese. It's an Indonesian language. And if you want to tell a girl, I love you, I could Senang Karakue. Right? And, and if you want to speak the national language, that is the language everybody can understand. It's not Dutch, but Sranantogo, Surinamese language. If you want to say, I love you, me love you. <laughs> it is broken English, me love you. And if you want to say I want you, you just say me want you. <laughs> me want you, me love you. That's the lingua franca and in Dutch you, you say it whole fine you. Fun you. It whole fine you. And I want to say thank you for having me here. I will try to do everything. Career. Why did I become a diplomat? Did I study to become a diplomat? Never. I never wanted to be a diplomat. I am a sociologist by profession. I have done a radio program too. Yes, and I'm still doing it. <laughs> on a gospel ra uh, radio station on TV and uh, every Friday so I can interview any one of you and still you're on air in Suriname. Yes, uh, I have two programs, one in my tribal language and one in the national language. So to be where you are now, you can be anything and still work on the radio and still be on TV. So your career, you decide who you become. Don't be a copycat, be yourself. If I was not myself, I would never be here because my father wanted me to be an economist and he didn't know what a sociologist was. So he was calling me names, cussing me every day and when I, uh, 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 finished the university, he says, well, she became so-so something, and so-so means nothing in our language. So it was so-so, lohi, so something like that. But later he was the proudest father of everybody. So I think we share the same. He was very proud. And he said, because I look like him, that's why I was successful. <laughs> my mom, the color is fair, and my father was very dark, and I resemble him more. So he says, all girls are smart because of daddy. So if you're smart, give it to them. <laughs> Thank you. to me. I have an English name, but I don't go by my English name. And it's not that my English name is not a nice name. I just don't like it. And I like my name. How many of you have heard someone called Likem? Not Elikem. Likem. I mean, you've met me, you've heard it. Now, if I meet someone and I say I'm called Likem, they try to make it funny like how for my child earlier, but my name sticks in your head and I'm there. And when you meet someone called Elikem, you tell the person, oh, I met someone called Elikem. Is it the same? So I don't like my English name, and I prefer to be called Elikem because I want to present where I'm coming from. And I'm from Keta Keji, and I talk about Keta a lot. I've convinced my friends to go for vacations there. I make sure I go there every month. I just go for video at the beach. I tell people, I tell them there's this resort, there's that resort. If you go and need help, 
just call me up and take someone to you. And that's how I'm presenting where I am coming from. I know most of us have you know, strong names we are not proud of. Uh -huh. Yesterday, we're having a discussion. Uh, people are called Gomita, you know, the heavy elements. And they are shy to admit it because we normally for how it is pronounced. I just want to tell of us that we need to project where we are coming from, yes. part of where you are coming from. If you should die today, God forbid, you'll be taken there. <laughs> and then is going to be held there. So let's present ourselves as Africans, as Ghanaians. And then let's tell the good story about Ghana. You and I are the people who will go there and tell people good things about Ghana. They will see the documentaries people come and do, they will see the slums, they will see the gardens, they will see everything. But it's what you and I carry out there that is going to project. And let me relate this to GIJ. When I was coming to GIJ, my dad wasn't in support. He wasn't in support because of the profession. It was the school he wasn't supporting. <laughs> GIJ wasn't here. It was at the old site, the Georgia College, Greenway Campus. A very small school, no hall, no hall. All my friends wanted to go to Legon, UCT. I bought tech form, I bought Legon form. And I had to pay for my own GID form. The agreement is you are buying your own form. If you get to school, I'll pay the fees. I bought the GID form, I had admission. I told my dad, oh, GID, no, he had trouble. GID had granted admission. He said, wait. I was like, no, I want to go to GID. He said, wait. I told my brother, he arranged. I came to a car, submitted my acceptance letter. I went back. He said, oh, let's wait a bit. Tech came, said, see, I told you, go to tech. I said, no, I want to come to GID. And for four years, every time he comes to the campus, he calls it for square. He goes like, my land is bigger than my school. I said, no problem. <laughs> this is the school you are in. The fees are too expensive. Your brother is here. He complained, complained, complained. But believe me, if I should go somewhere with my dad right now, but oh, this is my daughter. She went to JRJ. She's a TA. Every day, everyone believes. Even a bad driver. Like, <laughs> Please say it. And I'm proud I came here. You people go out there and you're like, JRJ oh, has nothing to offer. It's Put yourself out there. Do jobs. I've done jobs I haven't been paid for. I've done activation at Makola. I have auctioned at events. I've done a lot of things and I get to meet people because of these things that I do. But if you come and you feel like you are too pretty or you are too handsome or you are too you know, high to do things for free, I don't know how else you can make it. You do it for free for some time and then you will cash out the bake and it will make up for all the free shows, all the free events you MC, the Ashu and everything. At this point, we would like to call the guidance counselor for GIJ. He's needed at this point, and I'm glad you fall right after Kamala school and then Madam school. And he's come to talk about guidance and counseling. Tell us a few things about how to choose a career and how to go about this. He is in the presence of Mr. George Godfrey. <laughs>
That is how our society has become. Growing up, we have our interest, we have where we are inspired to be. On the other hand, our parents or the family in which we are born into have a different plan altogether for us. Myself, I was fortunate. Most men in my father's lineage were bankers. Apart from being a banker, nothing good comes out of you. Everybody has to be a banker. And unfortunately, I applied to Legon and a Tetrilin College. Then admission to a Tetrilin College came in first. My mother insisted that no, I don't want you to wait. That time I was beginning to develop so much interest in some other things, going to town, hanging out with my friends, and she was scared that quick taking the better part of me, so she wanted me to go to school. So I decided to go to a training college, and it became a huge problem in the house. Because from the training college, I could not become a banker. From the training college, I became a teacher. I taught for seven years. I became a headmaster of my school for three years. 10 years. But all those, all these times, I was putting myself together. I was putting myself together. Then, I decided that, okay, I've had 10 years of teaching experience. I need to look elsewhere. Then, I saw an advert specialized was looking for an auditor. I applied, and I became an auditor was specialized. I was with them for two years. Then Apex Bank made an advert. I applied, I left specialized, joined Apex Bank. I was with them for a while. GNG made an advert. I applied and I left the bank, came to GNG. When I was at the bank, my daddy became so happy. <laughs> Where he ever dreamt of seeing me as where I got into. But at some point, I felt I needed to what? Leave. I just want to draw our attention to the fact that, yes, we have our plans. We have where we really want to be. Growing up, I wanted to become a medical doctor. That was where my interest was. But I did not become a medical doctor. Neither did I become what my parents or my dad wanted me to become. I was listening to Kamala and he had his interest, apart from him being, being a science student, he had interest in becoming a journalist. So fortunately, he became a journalist. But in our time, we do not get where our interest is. You may have the interest of becoming the best journalist, but you may not end up becoming a journalist. What I want to draw your attention to is one aspect of career or a career type we call accidental career. Accidental career. We do not really plan that this is where I really want to be. This is where I really want to be. If you are fortunate enough and where your interest is, you are able to get there. Fine you get the job satisfaction, everything you need. If you are not fortunate enough, maybe your parents might have gotten a different plan for you altogether. If their plans go through, that is okay. But what if their plans are not working and where you really want to be is also not available? You need to position yourself such that you before on what you call an accidental career. Most of my colleagues see me and they say, you are lucky because 
you go and you get the opportunity. And I keep telling them that I don't see anything as luck. I would explain the lucky or the luck as preparedness meeting what? An opportunity. Walk around to prepare. If you will take nothing from here today, just go with the fact that wherever you are walking to, walk prepared because there are opportunities we come across every day. You may meet a very fine opportunity, but you are just not in the position to grasp the opportunity. When you hear of short courses, take them up. When you hear of seminars like this, be packed. When you hear there is a workshop somewhere, attend them. Put all of them together. It makes you a working, prepared human being. You may get somewhere and the least thing they are looking for is that workshop you attended somewhere and it will position you in a very fine place for the job. You get me? So always work prepared. Whilst I was teaching, I was teaching all right, but I did forensic account and audit. I was still teaching. I didn't know I was ever going to have an opportunity to specialize. I didn't know I was going to the bank. But I then started to do a course in uh, forensic accounting and audit. I did it. I didn't have any job then. I kept the certificate. I kept the teaching. From there, I went to UCC. I did Master of Science in Psychology. I was still teaching. So with the bank, when I had when I saw the advert with Specialized, I just applied with my forensic accounting and audit. And they took me in as what? The auditor. I was just working prepared. I had the certificate back there. So whilst in GIJ, you are studying to become PR persons, you are studying to become journalists. Fine. Take other opportunities. The, opportunity, the course you might be studying now may have nothing to do with journalism. When you hear of those courses, take them out. Who knows? You may go in for an interview as a, a, a news presenter or something. And from your certificate and your experience, they may find out that, okay, although you came in as a radio presenter, you can fit as a marketer instead. Because you went in what? Prepared. We are all focused on where our interest is. I want to become this. And that is where you are working towards. Some years back, you would wish that I become this person in the next three, four years. You would work towards it and gradually you will get there. When some people were born, the appearance with the demon says, oh, Mbawi, I am just waiting for him to grow. Then I'll put him in this particular company. The son is a big boy now, and daddy can hold the son and send him to that company. It doesn't work like that today. In few circumstances, you may have it. But it doesn't work like that. By the time you are a big boy, daddy would have lost that opportunity. Power switch. So put yourself in that position where you are already prepared. That is the most important thing. You talk to somebody. Kamala again made mention that he was selling samosa and stuff. Yes, at every point in time, opportunities do present themselves. You take advantage. I am so sure if that samosa business had really gone well, Maybe you would have changed your mind somewhere. Yes. Today I am here. I have other certificates hiding in my pair somewhere. An opportunity may present itself anywhere. And who knows? If I hear of it and I feel I am in the position to apply for it, I will go for it. 
You understand? Walk prepared. Put your house in order. The moment you get to meet any opportunity, you take advantage of it. You we'll go in. We are looking for this. Oh, okay. I don't have a qualification in that area. If the store they want to give the offer to you, take it. I am a journalist. So you go there and they say, oh, today we only have a, a, a position of receptionist. Oh, I can't do it. I am not a receptionist. I am a journalist. No. Put your house in order. So many people take up positions where they do not even have the prerequisite qualification nor the experience. A friend will tell you that if you give me, apart from there are few technical careers that you cannot be playing with, like medicine, engineering, and stuff. But me today, if you ask me to, if you give some uh, career choices to me, I will take them up. Today is Friday. I will take it up. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'll come Monday and I'm a qualified person. <laughs> Today, I might have no idea about it. If the opportunity comes and I feel I should take it, I will take it. Tomorrow, Saturday, Sunday, whatever I need to do to put me in that position to be able to render that service, you should put yourself together. You should put yourself together. At this point, you are going to face those challenges. What you really want to do, your parent will step in. It's either they are not interested or they feel it doesn't pay enough. So you definitely get that conflict between yourself and your family. You should know how to work around it. There are so many of us here if you ask them what do you really want to become, they are unable to tell you. They are in GNG because their parent wants them to be here. It's not really the issue. What I want to encourage all of us is that less wherever you find yourself, take a bit of whatever is there add it to yourself and just walk prepared walk prepared opportunities we meet every day if there is any other thing who should motivate you to chase a particular career i'm telling you it shouldn't be the monetary aspect money is good Money is good. I like money myself. We all like money. But it shouldn't be your priority. You should be looking at what we call job satisfaction. Job satisfaction. That's the work you are doing give you that happiness. There are so many people they are receiving a lot, as in their salary. But when they wake up in the morning, it is so hard for them to put themselves together to go to work. They are doing it, but it doesn't give them the satisfaction they really wanted. I was with the bank. Formerly, I was employed as a supervisor. I worked with them for four years. I was only a supervisor for one year. And I have to switch. I am not so interested in the auditing trails. Oh, no, 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 no. So I went from audit to credit. With the credit, I was in charge of people like this. People who have come to take loans, who are unable to pay back. People who are in distress situations. My business is collapsing. I need loan. So generally, you could tell that I am not so interested in the account stuff. I just wanted an opportunity that I could work. I could be of assistance to people. You've come for money. I bet you 300,000. I want to go into this business. The business is failing. 
but the bank is right behind me for their money. Some people do go to the extent of wanting to harm themselves because the person used the, the family house as collateral. If you are unable to pay, the bank will sell off the house. So that is where you sit the person down, you count the person. What are you doing or what are you not doing? We try to accept the person gradually, we find the loopholes, we try to correct them. And after some time, the business starts picking up. You see that smile on their faces. You understand? So fine. Don't make what you get be of so much importance to you. Some people feel I am choosing journalism because it's peace. Tell me, it's peace. <laughs> it does, eh? No worry. If you are doing it because that is where your passion is, it's okay. But in all of it, always work prepared. You can be a journalist today, an opportunity will present itself tomorrow, and by Monday, you are no longer a journalist. You've taken a new opportunity altogether. If there is anything you want us to talk about, if there is any discussion you want us to have, it's unfortunate I don't have an office here, but my office is at the Ringway campus, the block B, second floor. If it has to do with career, if it has to do with anything cancer, from family to relationship, I said that financial, can you be a reader? But apart from that, people are going through a lot. Somebody I encountered not long ago had to report on an accident scene. An accident scene. And just after the reportage, he feels he wants to quit journalism. You understand? Such a person needs to be given the right therapies to put him in a better position to do what he enjoys doing. Okay? So if there is anything you want us to talk about, you may come around. We may also get to ask at counseling at gig.edu.gh counseling at gig.edu.gh The counseling is spelled with a double L. With a double L. So whatever it is, do come to us. There is a lot to talk about. There is a lot we need to do before embarking on our choices of career. On that note, I will say a very big thank you for your audience. Thank you so much, Mr. Goffrey, the counselor for the Ghana Institute of Journalism. His office is at the Block B at the Ringway campus. Thank you so much. One thing they said is that you should work prepared. And as you are here today, start to work with prepared. Gather your what? Your staffs in the house. Let them work with you. Okay? So as you are here, you have witnessed something, or you have you have gained some knowledge today. Or you are gained. So what you have to do is that you just carry it along wherever you go. Is that okay? Yes, after my national service, I'm serving as an administrator of a school. I give my national service to the audit service of Ghana. Before I realize, uh, uh, you know, there is some embezzlement of 30,000 of teachers, less teachers. What I did is to make sure I cross check the account books, the things that are not in place, how they mismanage the environment. And these two young men, because of job, we complain that we don't have a job, we don't have a job. But the moment we get the opportunity, we, we try to receive the street opportunity. This young man dropped the 2006. And I had no knowledge in audit. Like uh, our counselor, you know, he's, he's an auditor. But because I, I did my national service there, 
we know how to come out with uh, uh, how to check uh, books and also how to check accounts and be able to identify the loopholes in, in there. Yes, I realized that the 30,000 is missing somebody's stomach in pocket. And so the boys have to be interdicted or they have to be you know, uh, pushed aside from administration. Right? So work prepared. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is a, is a lecturer in our prestigious school. I prefer to call him a political strategist because he's a senior political, uh, you know, well, uh, political analyst. Yes, I, I met him on some two occasions and I, Charlie, you can tell me the history of politics of Ghana. Uh, this is a person who is sacrificing his life to teach young men and women like us. Yes, I really want to go uh, to, to study under his shadows. Okay, I want to be a political strategist as a, as, a, as a side job because every four years I'll get money from that. <laughs> yes. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, with a round of applause, let's welcome Dr. Ajit Kanku. That's my calling. 
But of course, I've worked as a journalist and done a lot of stuff, so I teach print classes as well and other things. But my area really is political communication. Um, that's 300, and we have a number of people teaching it. So I'm sure very soon when we start doing it at the master's level, I might start doing that over there. But for a career, and for interest, and for me being myself, like this is my calling. Okay, you can look me up at 3 a.m. to talk about anything politics or political communication. Uh, so this is my stuff. And so this is the culmination of all my studies and uh, all my I don't know, gifts that God has given me in political communication strategy. Okay, because some of it really comes off the bat. Of course, I, I learned some of it in school, but some of it is just natural. So I put it all together um, into this compendium or this dossier uh, that I launched in 2016. Um, so the history behind this is that it, it's my PhD dissertation was actually on Barack Obama and his political campaign strategies. And it was a very big time, not just in the US, but in the world, because a black person had never become president of the most powerful nation in the world. And that was Obama. He turned politics upside down. Nobody ever thought that was going to happen. And thank God, I was studying in the U.S. at the time, uh, luckily. And so he became a subject of intrigue and a subject of a lot of interest for people who were not just living in the U.S., but all over the world, from Ghana to Kenya to South Africa to France to UK to Asia. People were just enamored by this person who had just been able to bust the political bubble over centuries, so many people have tried, from Jesse Jackson to Al Sharpton and on and on, tried to become president. They were never, ever successful. And then here comes the gentleman whose dad is from Kenya, and his mom, his mom is from uh, Kansas in the US. So he has a white mom and then a black dad. Okay, and not just a black dad, a black dad from Africa, not an African American, right from the homeland of Africa. His dad was just like me, who went to school in the US to study. And then got married to a white girl and then had a baby. Or I think he never got married actually. So he just had a baby with a white girl. <laughs> so, and, and it happens. You know, I have friends who decide to get married to white people. But that's fine. So, um, so yes, he had direct roots to the continent. Okay, and then he becomes the first 10 senator. That was the first time he was becoming a senator. Out of school, um, he became a social worker. So, sociology. He became a social worker. <laughs> And uh, for the first few months that he was out of school, he was just like you guys, you know, working for NGOs, not being paid, trying to do community mobilization. Sometimes he organized events only like six people who show up and all of that. And then he decides to run for Congress, he's lucky, he decides to run for Senator, or for the Senate, he's lucky. And then people don't run for president in their first year as senators. Okay, yes, you've got to be there for a long time to know. And it's, you know, I mean, Ignore this. It's difficult. The, the American political system is very complex with a lot of history and intricacies. So to best through that white Anglo Saxon bubble, <laughs> it's almost like the ninth miracle or the ninth wonder of the world. But he does that in his first year, he decides he's going to run for, 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 for president in his first year as a senator. And people are like, come on, guy, you are reaching over yourself. You know, there's the Clintons, there's all those people who've been there for a long time, and I mean, you gotta take your time, wait for your time. He was a very young person at the time. But he said he believed strongly that this was what God called him to do. So he decides to run. I remember the first time the polls came up, Hillary Clinton was at like 50 something, it was like in the second day. Nobody knew who, I'm, I'm telling you, nobody knew who he was beyond his hometown people. Apart from the hometown that he ran for the whatever city and went to, nobody knew him. Bill Clinton had been president for two terms, one of the most successful American presidents, and then uh, Hillary Clinton, the wife, becomes a, what? A senator, and then decides to run for president. So they were really well known, okay? And, and so it looked like he was overreaching himself, but he said he was going to do it. I remember the first time, luckily, 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 he came to my school about three different times. And the first time he came, he struggled to get an audience. People were like, who is this person? You know, yeah, they didn't even go and listen to him. So it was after some time. So I'm giving you the background to see how monumental his achievement was. I remember the first time he ever got an endorsement from the media, from the media anywhere in the world. 
or in the US anywhere was from a campus newspaper, a university newspaper. And that was my university in Bristol of Iowa. We had a newspaper called the Daily Iowa. And we had written an editorial on him that the young people were in support of him, young people loved him from different races. And that was the first time any newspaper had endorsed him. And he carried it like he was old because he was really struggling for attention. And then he put it on his website, he put it on his advertisements that day. This paper has endorsed me as a campus newspaper. The editor at the time was a very smart lady called uh, Chelsea Belfermata, and she eventually got a job at the White House. Okay, so this is some of the stuff we are telling you guys. Work for the campus newspaper, do an intention, do all the legwork that you gotta do. She was just a third or fourth year student at the time. When she graduated, she got a job at the White House. You know how difficult it is to work at the White House? <laughs> People who live in New York, DC, and they don't even get close to it. She was in Iowa. She went from Iowa to the White House. Okay, just because she was the editor of a newspaper and she wrote a great editorial. Okay, and we'll talk about editorials maybe in some of your classes. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, um, one of the reasons why I'm very happy to be is because a lot of the things that I wanted to tell students are the things that you've said. And when I say it in class, I begin to answer me. <laughs> so I'm very happy that they said it all. When I say to they say, oh, money, uh, would they pay us? When I send opportunity, people say, how much is the, how much is the pay? How much is the, all those things. You know, no, 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 no. There's like, excuses or all excuses. We send them out to go do stories. They're like, ah, we are stressing them and all of that. But he used stuff that he did at an internship for his classes to get his first leg in. And people have come back to me with testimonies that at the time they applied for stuff, they didn't have anything ready except what they wrote in my classes. At the time, of course, they said a lot of things about me. But they came back and said that at that time, they said, show something. And they really had not done ready anything except what they wrote in my classes. And they showed it. That's what they got. They showed. And they got the opportunity. Okay? And more than one person. It might not be all the angry people, but there are few stories like that. So why my friends are complaining, don't listen to them, don't follow them. Because they are using that to get opportunities. And that's all that they said to me. I'm very happy it didn't come from me. So anyway, we are going to be say something. But anyway, so, so back to Obama. So now he, became, he becomes a phenomenon. And I was working in, in, in a campus newspaper at the time. Myself, I was a grad student. But I took time to work on a newspaper, and that's what they are saying you should do. I work for two newspapers, two newspapers and two radio stations. Okay, all out there: KRUI, IPR, Daily I One, Iowa State Daily. And and so I covered the elections. I covered the 2008 American presidential elections, and then the 2012 American presidential elections. The first time was for newspaper, the second time was for a radio station. And I got close, I got a front view of everything, I attended some of the rallies, I did. all of that, all of that. And so, when it was time to write my dissertation, or the high school project work, I began thinking about a topic. I wanted to do what some of you guys do, just take a routine topic, write on it, and get my way out. And then my advisor, or we yeah, we call it uh, spoke to me and said, well, I see you cover all this stuff. You've done this coverage, you've written columns, I used to write columns and all of that. Have you thought about doing a dissertation on uh, Barack Obama? Because you seem to have written a lot about him, covered him and all of that, but have you studied him in a scholarly way, his strategies? I said, oh, that's a fantastic idea. I never thought about it. And it was in the library um, when we had that conversation. And so I decided to do my research on him. How did a person with a black skin or persona or African background managed to convince so many people because the state I was was 92% white I don't like blacks okay 92% white voting for a black person how did that happen and that was the story how did he communicate how did he, he use his African background as a tool for political communication to convince people because black is equal to bad dirty criminal evil Yes, in the mindset of the typical American. So I did spend three years doing a dissertation. Thank God there was a lot of pain. Trust me, I don't know you guys who experienced pain. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of pain and torture 
and <laughs> it was not easy. So we spent time doing all of that over three years. I think you guys spent six months or something, three months doing a project together. Okay, spent three years working on it. Thank God I graduated, and then I made a lifetime decision to come back to Ghana. Although I could have job offers, I could have stayed there. There was no reason to come back. Uh, because only about 2% of the American population has PhDs, and so once you get it, you, you, the, the path is clear. It was just a very personal decision I made to come back to Ghana. And um, a lot of people were disappointed, my professors and all of that. They thought I was going to stay, get a great job, and be one of the alumni who flaunts all of that. But yes, I, I made that personal decision, and I came here, got my first job at UG, University of Ghana. And the rest is history. But at the point, I said that I was going to put everything that I've learned together into this. Okay, so that uh, other people could learn from it. Uh, but also, I wanted to tell the story. I wanted to tell the grammar story. I wanted people to appreciate where I come from and where I've been as well. And so I spent another two years um, rewriting the dissertation because, you know, that is very technical and very theoretical. So I spent another three years rewriting it to make it, um, I don't know whether to say attractive, but uh, um, at least digestible to people without the technical language, yes. So I did that, um, a lot of midnight writing and all of that. Sometimes I get ideas in odd places. I have to write it down. So this, I still have my notes, the pen, the one I wrote, I wrote in pen, you know, uh, little, little papers, some books, all of that. I still have that now, stuck in my archive. When I do my museum one day, I'm going to put it there. Just, just to show that this was the beginning of it. I mean, I've rushed, I used to look at a at the time. I've rushed from a dentist to my office at Lake at 3 a.m., 2 a.m. before, just to write stuff, because I know if it leaks at the time, I'm not going to have it in the same way that I had it. Okay, so that's all that I went through. And those of you are writers, probably know this. And then we came up with this, um, and then the application. Um, yes, there's a money part of it, because it, it does cost some money to, to write and publish. Um, and so for beginners like you, um, that's something to think about. But there's a way through it, because I didn't have a big name publisher. I, I didn't go to an academic um, university for them to publish it. It was just self-published. So it's just like you guys. Um, and when I was invited here, I was told that you have classes that you did ask you to write creative stuff and all of that, and that you want to be able to um, take it to the next stage. So I, I, once I was done with the script, I, start, I started looking around for um, publishers. So there are professional publishers who will take it and then put it through a whole stage, editing, reading, publishing, marketing your book, making sure they get the ISBN, putting it on various platforms. So those are professional publishers. I don't think you and I are there, okay, because those are big people. So you know, I think they were one of the biggest things in the world. She wanted to choose that. So they will come and approach you. You tell them your story. You write the book. And then they will be responsible for everything. Some of them even buy the rights. So you pay a big sum of money. You can buy a house with it. Okay? And then they buy the rights for the book. And then you take your money and you are home. Some people also don't like that. Because if you do get a lot more from the book than the now some they give them. So you just find a nice deal with them. And then it's a partnership. And then after that, the publishers do part of the web, you also do uh, part of the web of promoting the book. Uh, but if you are like you and I, who are just starting, and we don't have, I mean, um, a once in a lifetime story or whatever, uh, there are, there's a lot that you can do because there's, there's just so much resources these days um, that you can use to promote your own book. And we also live in a very uh, media divergent age. So um, people come to the news not just from the traditional media. Uh, print, online, video, and all of that. There is a lot of self-publication or self-marketing arguments. So when I was almost done with the book, I began thinking about the launch. So the first thing I'll tell you is that find a great story to tell. Find a great story to tell. And it can be your own story. That's the I know a student, uh, John Paul, J.P. Lawson. He was a level 300 student or something with first met. He wrote a very beautiful book. I, I bought a book. I told people about the book. It's in my, I've displayed it in my shop. It's one of the big, nice one. Just a story just like you, but it was a great story. You know, and it wasn't a out of the world story. It's just a story about stories about life, life values, honesty, sacrifice, pain, 
you know, uh, achievement. Just things, just ordinary things, love, you know. And I'm sure we all have those stories, okay? Some, some of the times I let people write profile stories in class and I read the stories and I'm like, well, you know, you mean that you actually went through this, like your parents? Got involved in Latin at this age, and both of them, you know, both of them, and you have to do this to come to school, and all of that. Like, I read a lot of stuff, you know, so you always have stories to tell, you know, and, <laughs> and so be yourself, like she said, still be confident and proud, own your story, own whatever it is you want to tell. And it might not just be about yourself, but it might be about the skill that you have. Some people just love, I don't know, uh, very, very, very specific things. Own it. If you like food, own it. Just take it and use it as your trump card. You can visit different restaurants and then write reviews on the restaurant. Write very nice. Trust me, people who are coming to Ghana will be looking at, okay, I'm coming to Ghana. Where exactly? What is the best restaurant? Where should I go? They will go there and they will read it. Because people don't normally do that. Right? So, there's a reason why God puts the interest in you. It's for something. You just don't like food because you want to be fat. There is a reason why. So use that, you know, to, for, if you like traveling, somebody they can't sit down like at one place. They have to be moving. Traveling, doing different things, traveling to different places. Become a travel writer. When you go to family or something, don't just go and then be looking around and chatting and enjoying your food. Take pictures, take videos, make a vlog of your trip over there and put it together into a compendium, either a, 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 a website or write, write about it or something. Turn your interest into what a money-making machine or, and write about all of that. If you can't write about yourself, look for um, a subject that you are interested in. This is the subject I was interested in. It might look so narrow, but there was a lot of what? Interest and market for it. Once I finished, People who did, do not traditionally like politics were still interested in the whole subject of Obama, okay, and what he had achieved for the world. So the other thing that I'll say is the book cover also counts a lot. When I got to the airport, and, and, and I'm talking about when I returned and I settled here, and then I was, okay, so let me, so after the book was written, I found a publisher, uh, I asked around, and they told me about one, Digibooks. Who does it for a lot of um, I don't know academics and other prominent people in the country? So if you are thinking of a good publisher, then I think we should start thinking about Digibooks, Sahara Publishers, and I think uh, there's a third one if I remember, like W O E L I, Woolly Publishing. So they are really good at that, and Digibooks is excellent. So I approached them, and they took it up, and they said they want to publish it. And it's not a complicated process; you just have to. Know. Give it to them, we do the layout and other things. And then the very publish. But I began thinking about the launch. Because that is one of the places you can make your money from. The launch of the book. So I got one tip I'll tell you is that have a, a book launch team. So there's a pre-launch part, then there's the publication part, and then there's the post-launch part. So the pre-launch, you can start writing about the subject. Okay, so for me, it was very natural because since 2008, I was, even 2007, I started writing about elections, all of that. 2008, the election happened, I was still writing. If I see a film made media international correspondent, I was reporting from the US to Ghana on stuff like that. So sometimes I have to look at PM because that's when it's like 7 p.m. or something, or 8 a.m. here, you know, and I mean, I had to. I always start fighting some of my roommates because of that, because I was disturbing them at 3 a.m. You know, so write about a subject. Let people be known for it, basically. Yes, be known about it uh, for, for that kind of stuff. So be writing a little bit, have a blog, okay, be writing about it. So be writing about the subject. So I don't get to know you for that thing. And when you are writing a book, they'll be happy to buy it, okay, because they know you for that. So that's one thing I did. With the launch, I did two different launches, and it might not be your story, it's just my launch. I, and I didn't have to do it, because it kind of cost me some money, but I just decided this is what I want to do. So I had a local launch and an international launch, okay? So the international one, I did in the US, and the local one, I did it here. So when I got to the airport, okay, we did it in four universities, um, University of Iowa, Iowa State, Harvard, thank God, 
uh, UPenn, and then Columbia. So I have three Ivy League schools out there, the top of the top. Uh, the story about how I got in there is a, a whole different thing. But I got to the airport, and when they were checking my baggage and other things, the airport people opened it up like they always do. When they are looking through, you see this book. Like, oh, what's this? It's like, what? You wrote this? Because they checked out my passport and all of that. I said, wow, you must really be a smart guy. And that was the end of it. They stopped looking through my things. <laughs> I never thought they would be interested. Because these are what you call them immigration people and all yeah. of that. Very strict. She knows how it works. Very strict. And at the airport, they, are, you know, they don't joke around with their dogs and other things. They, I'm telling you that if I had stuff in my bag, they would have gone. They stopped talking about me. They were engaging me about it. Oh, okay, so what is this? Yeah, what is this? They were asking me, what is that? What is that? So, at this Obama and you dressed, okay, so what is this? What does this mean? That was all the conversation was about. So, have a very attractive cover for your book. Because people don't have time to really read. But they may buy it because of the cover. Or because they want to be known as people who read or something, or to be part of the text. <laughs> so that buy it to say that they own it. They own the book, yes. So that was my first surprise, you know. I think one person actually asked for a copy at that point. You know, even before I got into the country, through the immigration, you know. So we get out there, our first place was Iowa. We had a big lunch there. Um, I don't know. So I don't have pictures from my wife, it's just a lot. But this one was at Harvard. Okay. Um, and this is the Harvard um, African Law Student Association in one of their classrooms. So they actually hosted me. And for me, I think that was the apology of it all. Because even authors who write in the US, all of them get invited to present at Harvard. Okay. And so that was really, really big. And that blew everything off. From that time, Everybody just wanted it because, okay, like you were at Harvard, you presented this stuff over there. What was in that book at all? <laughs> you know, you were kind of intrigued about it. So at that point, it took a life of its own. People just wanted to get it, to own it, and to know what really was in it. So think critically about how you launch your book. I might have lost money or paid a lot of money to get myself there, but of course, it will pay off at the end. Okay, so. They went to UPenn, which is University of Pennsylvania, and then um, so this was a group of students um, after the talk over there. Um, they are all students, so and it's hard to get into Harvard Law School. So these are very smart people. They ask me a lot of difficult questions. <laughs> and, uh, because I spent three plus two five years working on it, I had a lot of nice stuff to also um, tell them we had a good time. So I think that really had a ripple effect back in Ghana. So people here went out looking for the launch here because they knew I was here. So they're like, okay, when I'm coming back, when I do the Ghana launch, the Ghana media were talking to me. So that's free media. Okay. Yes. Free media. I'm telling you, that's like that. And it does cost money to go on air to market your book. Please see the media, I can tell you about it. If you are just going on the media to talk about your book, of course they'll give you an invoice. And if it's just for five minutes, we pay a lot of money. I have free air time. On CD, mention any TV station in Ghana. It had a ripple effect. I just had free air time because of that. So when I came back, the bus was already there. The bus had been built to a crescendo, you know. And myself, I used video uh, to promote the book as well. So I did a little bit of video. Some of it I did in New York. Some of it I did when I came here, uh, just to cover certain aspects of the book as well. And then we had the Ghana launch. But because the bus had already been built around the Ghana launch, it was very easy. He, a lot of the media came, and a lot of people attended the event. And the sales also went well, okay, as well, because people were kind of, kind of interested. And so people will start from, you know, the first people who buy it, we mention some outrageous prices, okay, and pay you money for it. So there were a couple of groups, and there were those who waited to buy it at a normal price as well. So at least you get a lot of stuff from there, okay? Um, and then there was the post strategy, the post as well. So you got to do readings, book tours, and book book reviews. So basically, what I did was a book tour, even the brief part, I did a book tour, and then the post, I went to universities, I went to places, other places I got invited, and then I went to talk about it. So 
this is um, some of this is my experience. Um, if you go and you read about how to do this stuff, I realized that a lot of the stuff that I did um, was basically what we were talking about. So I'm just going to um, go through them really quickly. The first one is that start by creating your brand. Okay. Start by creating your brand, which is what I think I did indirectly or unknowingly. Because who came to know me till so today? People call me Afrocentric Obama. Well, yes, Afrocentric. So, and people came to know me as political communication. Like, that's all I do. Elections. I don't really like talking on morning shows and other things before elections. But when it gets to elections, I'm quite hyper about it. So that's why this guy was saying that he would come and get to that. He also went and sit somewhere. It was four years, and he went to the <laughs> so I built that brand for myself as somebody who is into political communication. That was one. So once I wrote a book on political communication, it was natural. So you build a, a brand for yourself. It becomes very important and it makes things easier when you're releasing your book. Two, create a website. So I did create a website as well. Create a website and that is where you can put so many things. You can put your bio. People get to read about you, what you've done. You put a photo there. You can put excerpts of your book there as well. Because once people read excerpts of the book, they are really interested to, to get to know more. Okay, so you tease them early uh, in the excerpts part. You can also put a link to where they can find your book to buy. You can put uh, you can put contact the way that they can contact you. You can put links to your social media. You put links to your social media on your website, and it's just a good way to present and also brand yourself, okay? So, um, create a website. The next thing is create an email list. Okay, well, I don't know, who are you doing that but create an email list. When you go for an event, you see, marketing is about connections and networking. So when you go for an event, don't just finish and go. Talk to people, connect with them. Till today, when I go for an event and I finish, hey, I'm not shy and I don't feel too big to talk to people. I will talk to you. I will take your phone number. I will take your email. And I just keep it in my bag and other things. Great. So if you look at my phone, my podcast, you have such a large bank. So when it gets to time, you can contact them individually. So you send out that information. And these are people who are interested in you and the work that you do. Okay, they follow you. So it comes from the brand you built. And they know what you do and they follow you. They are interested in it. Okay, people are always trying to find out, oh, what is the next time you are going to talk about this one? So put all the contacts together and let them update them on what you are doing. Send them snippets, information, posters, little things. And you'll be able to follow or you'll be able to then network with them or sell your stuff to them. And then they'll just send it to other people as well. Also, try to reach out to reviewers. Okay, to book reviewers. Try to reach out to book reviewers because they are powerful to what they write alone can let people go and take that book up. And if they write the review in a daily graphic, whatever, somebody can read the review and say, no, I need to read this book, or something like that. So reach out to the reviewers. There's something here that says, um, choose the right book cover. Okay, choose the right book cover. And I, I think I indirectly did that as well. So that's what I talked about, you know. A lot of things rest on the book cover that, um, whether you like it or not, people judge a book by its cover. People say, you know, but people judge a book by its cover. So spend a lot of time, okay? You can get somebody to do it for you. And the, the right book cover can stop potential book readers, okay? To actually pick up your book from the shelf and buy it. There are times that you bought things that later on you realize that you didn't even need it. But just because you like the way it's going to be bought it. I remember when I was doing this book cover. I mean, the designer, we went back and forth because I could have used the picture, but I didn't. Okay, I could have picked the picture from somewhere and used it. But the designer had so much problems with me because I really, really wanted this to come out the way it was. So it's like, ah, this man is difficult. <laughs> if I say this, he's saying that. If I say this, you know, I went through three different designs. One of them was my, my old schoolmate from Akosovo International School where I did, where I did my GHS. Um, she didn't do it the way I thought it should be. There was a second person who was working at, um, I think, Global Media Alliance. He tried his best, but he didn't come out. Until the third person was able to get it this way. So don't settle for less. 
And I am very happy because at a point I almost stopped because I was like, okay, am I just being unnecessarily petty or is it that I am just from space or somewhere? But I'm happy I, I went through with it, you know, and that third guy was able to get the way it came up. You know, but I, of course I had to pay some money for it because it was original. Now offer your book for free at some point, okay, especially at the beginning. Have a promotion. Okay, do a, what is it, a, a test or a quiz or something, do some promotional sales and offer your book for free at some point and get people involved in it, create a buzz around it. You can even offer a percentage of your money for, I don't know, a social service, like an orphanage or something. Yes, just, just offer it, make a discount, okay, just get people to get to know it the first time. If they now get to know about the book, they will read it. Then they will now do and tell other people about it. It becomes self-promotional um, once you actually get people to sit down and read it. Use Facebook and other social marketing for building awareness tools. So social media, have a Facebook page. Like have a business Facebook page for your book. Not your personal one. The one that I'm not even about those funny nicknames. Create a business one for your book in particular. So I'm like, Thousands and thousands of followers on Facebook from Zambia, Kenya, other places. You know, I even had invitations to come and speak in different countries. Uh, there was even one library in Kenya uh, who wanted to index it. It's kind of sad because I was really busy, so I didn't follow up with it. You know, I regret I was really busy at the time, trust me, organizing this thing. So I think I'll follow up with it again. But yes, this was a whole this thing. Minor something, yeah. So they wanted to index it in one of the libraries in Kenya. Then one of my colleagues uh, used it as a text in class in Houston. No, no, uh, Missouri. He was teaching a class on race or something in Missouri, and then used this as a text in his class. And then where else? Um, it was recommended um, as a text for political communication um, also here, I think two or three years ago as well. So, um, let people know about what you are doing. Um, and the people that contacted me, not all of them were what I knew. Some of, a lot of them were from Facebook. People who I never knew would appreciate the things I'm doing. So don't think it's just your friends. Don't be forcing your friends, put it on just your WhatsApp page and your personal page for your friends to like it. No, create a personal page and you'll be amazed that the other people who will appreciate you. Because a prophet might not be recognized in their own home. But other people in different places you'll be surprised how they'll be so enchanted. Like sometimes you just are right about it, you know, about what you've done. And there are not people you necessarily know personally. It's not your cousin or your brother. Sometimes your mother doesn't even care about the work that you've done. Or your dad doesn't even understand what you've done. They've never even watched your show before. Like they're like, ah, you should give you something, something, you know. But other people somewhere else will appreciate the stuff that you do. And if you allow it to go down, it will be amazing how far it will go. So make use of digital tools, social network tools, and Facebook, Twitter, and all of that. And connect current events to your story or message. So what this means is that when there's a current thing going on in the political environment, or your story is about abortion, or whatever it is, connect it to something with the news, and people will appreciate it. So if there's an election in Kenya, I reviewed the election in Kenya and the political strategy of the two parties, Kenya Kwanza and the Azimio party. So Kenya Kwanza is Kenya first, and Azimio stands for national unity. So I reviewed the strategies of Kenya Kwanza and then Azimio, and it was like it was the differences couldn't have been greater. Okay, all of that. So that, and then I made a reference to my strategies in my book. Well, I have a chapter on campaign strategy, a campaign organization. And if as you had read it, it would have helped you. So you make a reference to that, put a link there, and other people will read it and ask for it. So always connect your event, your story to current event. So, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that this should work for now. Um, influences, influences, social media influences or celebrities. Okay, it was very easy for me because some of them actually wanted to associate with my book. So someone like to this tech cafe that I thank you very much, God bless him. He was very he said, I don't mind, I can do a video for you. Uh, I can even come and MC your show or your book launch for free. Okay, in fact, Bernard Abner, who's also my friend, he wanted to be the MC. Uh, 
Kafi was not good. So he eventually later became a reviewer, and Kafi was the MC. I and mean, the people will love to participate with it. So make use of celebrities or social media influencers to share your story or to share your message as well. I believe that's the last thing that I would say for now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention and for listening to me. Student. I don't want to hear Dr. Newt three years to write his book while giving us nine weeks. Nine weeks or not, next week I'm getting already. Thank you for that. But I like it for years, it has to start with you. And um, I would like to just say, add one sentence or statement to what you said. We have students from the Creative Writing class who have won awards from the creative writing class, from what they wrote from the creative writing class. At that time when my boss, Dr. Adam was available, they would give you their books, go to their lunch, they would nominate for this award here, that award here. And one guy who won all awards for his book in the creative writing class, they didn't think he could write, and he didn't think people would nominate him. He's just there, then he receives a, an email, he been nominated for this award, and he called me, thinking, what is going on? I feel like, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. It was someone who read a short story on a blog or had um, an opportunity to read his book that kept recommending him to this award scheme. So if you take it seriously, it will definitely work out for you. We would like to call Mr. Kwame Fekwe. He is an entrepreneur and the president of the Korea Association of Ghana. Thank you, Mrs. Yes. Miss. Yes. Okay. Congratulations to everyone who has been here. I believe we are tired. Yeah. Are we? Yeah. Very tired. We've learned a lot. I am Kwame Bepren. She mentioned my name. I'm the president of the National Korea Association of Ghana. Who knows what Korea is? Who knows what Korea is? Say again. They deliver things. Okada. Is it Okada? It's not necessary. You know, we are going to have an interactive session. Okay. So that at least, I mean, what we have. It seems I'm seeing some people frowning and everything. But you know what? Are we happy? Are we happy? Yes. Why are we happy? Come again. You've obtained some knowledge. Okay. So I'm just coming to talk about some things more. Okay. Mm? Choboy. Yay. Choboy. Yay. Choboy. Yay. Choboy. Yay. Choboy. Yay. Choboy. Yay. The energy is not there. Choboy. Yay. Choboy. Yay. Choboy. Yay. I can see a lot of ladies here, but everybody is seated quiet. You are tired, eh? Okay. Who was this? <laughs> Energy is high. Who wants this? <laughs> Who wants this? <laughs> oh, nobody wants it. <laughs> nobody wants it. I asked who wants this. I've covered me. I asked who wants this. Me. Nobody wants to work for something small. Everybody wants to work for something big. But how is it possible? How is that possible? You want to work for something small? You want to work for something big? Because you went to school for how many years? You are schooling for how many years? Four years. Four years. A whole lot of pressure. And stress, but some of you have boyfriends and girlfriends. Yeah, so they are helping you to finish the course. Yes. Is that also? It's also. It's also. You see, entrepreneurship is one of the difficult tasks. Becoming an entrepreneur is one of the difficult tasks. You know, I was far away in the bush. 
Sika Obush. People call me Sika Obush. Yes. I was far away in the bush. Then one gentleman contacted me. Oh, Mr. Kwamdogren, I want you to come and speak on a few things. Uh, you being the president of the National Korea Association, what we do is we dispatch goods and services around. So you see a lot of motorcycles with courier uh, boxes at the back. Some of them don't have courier boxes. I have DHL under me, I have FedEx under me, I have various companies, and I have my own company under me. I'm a logistics consultant. Starting a business is one of the difficult tasks. You may think it's easy. You sit down to draw a plan. Who are you going to, I mean, market this business to? Is it my immediate family? Is it my immediate friends? Is it uh, my classmates? Who? How am I going to sustain this business? You know, you can start a business, but how to sustain it is the problem. Because I use myself as a practical example. I started a career business. I won't say I started with one CD. Those people who have been lying to you, it's not true. <laughs> yes. I started business, I was working with a company. I started to save. So in, in habit, uh, in that, that habit of what saving, because I started saving because I wanted to start something for myself and also be able to meet up the demands of people. I realized five years ago, a lot of people were not doing courier. We knew of the DHL, we knew of the, even the DHL and the FedEx and that of the Ghana Post. It was, uh, they were more, doing more or less like the cargo car kind of delivery, what they still do. Then I understood the operations of courier because I realized that courier is something that people need. You need a service to be rendered to you. Now, if you are home or you are in the campus, you've left some stuff at home. You need someone to pick it up because you can't join a vehicle from uh, Jolu back to Kaswa. These people, you need this service. So I sat down, I drew the plan, I asked myself, is this business going to be sustainable? That was five years back. I said, yes, I can do it. Because if I want to do it and I believe in myself, yes, I am ready to do it. So as an entrepreneur, you need to be ready to do it. But before you become an entrepreneur, you need to save towards that. Get those little, little monies. I worked in Tema in a company for six good months. Today, because of loyalty, the very boss I worked for has appreciated me for whatever I'm doing today. He's able to call me and ask me, Kwame, I need uh, a courier license for this and that. Is because of that little effort that I pushed in. Six months, no pay. That's what to tell Morning, evening, morning. Look at the stress. I wake up at three o'clock. I get to tell at five o'clock. As at the time, the N1, we had so much traffic. And this is where I am today. So starting a business is not easy. If anybody tells you it's easy, or you can use one CD, it's a lie. Starting a business, what you need to do is to save towards the business. And that is where you can make some money and start a business. Because today, Ghana here, a lot of people say, okay, I want to get done with school. When I'm done with school, then I'll look for some opportunities and go out there, go and work for greener pastures, look for money. I mean, there are very people who go out there to look for the money. They come back again and come and set up businesses. Yes, because they have to save. Now, as me myself, using myself as an example, at a point, every business, after three years, you should know your business is failing or you are succeeding. So if after three years, your business dwindles down, then it means, my brother, go back again, recapitalize, restructure, restrategize, and then hit it back again, because by then, you may have had such experience. You get it? So starting a business is not easy. Getting to the third year, myself, getting to the third year, it became very difficult. 
getting to that year, I was struggling. It got to a point in time, I have to go and look for money out there and come and pay that salary. Now, you start a business, remember that the very people you started with are not going to be the same people you are going to be with. Each and every time I have staffs working with me, after a couple of years, some of them will move on. Some of them will do things that will be contrary to the company. Some of them feel, may feel too big because they feel when they started with you, you were too small. But they see you growing. And each time you are growing, a lot of things changes. So they feel you are also changing. But it's for the sustainability of the business. Always learn to plan. Make sure you, you market. Just like Dr. H said, network. Each and every day, take such opportunities. Even when you are not invited for, take such opportunities and go for some of these conferences. I believe you've heard about the GEA grants that they are giving out there. You can, you, if some of you have registered your businesses, you can use that opportunity to also apply. I see a lot of ladies here, and it gives uh, preferences to ladies. So if you're a lady and you run your own business, now they will choose you over me. No matter how many years I have been in business, they believe that they want to empower ladies. So when you are starting your business, think about all of this. Look at the way forward. Network. Network. Uh, there's a saying that your network is your net worth. The sort of people you relate yourself with. Maybe today your friend you have him in JIJ may become the minister of something that there's a connect don't leave your friends behind let's all move together as an entrepreneur when you get there you can help someone to also move higher thank you very much thank you very much Mr. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Comsin from the Center for International Studies At this point, we'd like to call on APSA. APSA, they have a short presentation for us. So we'll call on the representation for APSA to invite a short presentation. And if you have any questions, please be jotting them down. We'll take two questions after. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, all protocols observed. When, when you are put in a graveyard like this, it's very difficult. So uh, just pardon me, but we have something wonderful at APSA that we would like to share with you. Um, my colleague has just gone out, but I would have wished he, uh, he was here to do something very simple. So my name is Cyril, and I am um, working with APSA marketing and corporate relations, um, head of comms and sponsorships. And then my other colleague is also into uh, one of our executives. I didn't start from GIJ. I didn't do journalism here. But while I, when I was in school, I already sort of had a view of where I wanted to go. So I didn't do anything in journalism in the first year or anything in PR in the first year. But because I knew where I wanted to go, I selectively did elective courses in areas that I know would be to my benefit. So for example, I realized I was in school of, um, I was in the University of Ghana. So while I do my undergraduate, I realized the theater arts um, department or school of theater arts had a course they call Media and Society. So I took one of that as my elective. I also realized they had playwrights. That helps you with your writing skills. So I also took something in playwright. But what that meant for me was that I was doing extra credits. 
So I was doing much more than what I needed to do. If I had to do 18 credits in a semester, I was doing always the maximum. Sometimes these sacrifices help. And for me, it helped greatly when I went into School of Communication Studies for my postgraduate. It was much easier to fit in and then find my level quite quickly. Okay, so um, we'll keep quiet a lot because I know you, um, you spent quite a lot of time already, but we are a very energetic team. We like to play hard and we like to work hard. That's my colleague, um, Carl. Um, because when you get into the work environment, there are stressful situations that can break you. And you need to be, be able to manage the stress that comes with the work environment. What we learn in school, it's always not what we meet at the work environment. There are people who have come from settings like this, or they've done marketing and entered into our system, and they find it very difficult because they realize what you learn in school, the application is quite different. And therefore, I think what we've talked about, about the internships and immersing yourself in it is very important because you learn on the job with some of those things. But before I go into what you are doing, you know, I'm a bank, I can't come here without telling you what we have for you. So for students, we have a very wonderful account called the Ignition account. That it's friendly for you. The account opening process is lighter. All you need is your Ghana card and some of your school particulars to show that you are a student. And then you can be signed on. It gives you some earnings, you know, usually when you have certain accounts that you are pulling out, current account, you can't get a lot of um, interest on it. But this has been designed knowing that you are not working so that you don't deplete the little resources that you have from you. And it comes with also some freebies, usage of um, the uh, digital channels and all that, and free debit cards because you know you like to also do a lot of shopping and swiping and all that, and you have the contact list. So you, just, you don't even need to uh, touch your post or terminal. You just swipe and then you are off. We've come up with something very interesting. Now I go to the ATM, I just have my phone, I go on my app, and then I just withdraw. So for a long time, I can't even remember the last time I used my debit card. I want to make things more convenient for you. And you have up to 20% discount on a lot of outlets, partners that we have, shops that you can enter to educational, um, shops that have educational materials and all that for you, and a lot more also on lifestyle, and you get some of the things that we do, supporting young people to get ready for the world of work. Now what is ready to work? So ready to work is a soft skill program that we have developed. It's our proprietary tool and as a bank that we use to support young people to get you ready for the world of work. Now, it's a different thing, as I said, being in academia, being in school, it's a different thing when you step into the world of work. And there are so many things that usually give us a shock when we enter into the world of work. So, Ready to Work is a program, online program, that would help you navigate through this process, okay? It is also certified, and um, you can get your certificates from it and all that. It also gives you skills that you need to either be employable or be self-employed. So we are looking at both ends because some of you will go out and set up your own jobs. What are the skills that you need? What are the soft skills that you require um, to, to do this? And recently we've also um, um, developed an app, 
the ready to work app that will make it easier for you to go through the studies. What does it actually deal with? So we have four main areas, work skills, people skills, skills and entrepreneurial skills. I'll come uh, into that later on, but you can go on to the ready to work um, site by going on readytowork.afsa.africa and then it will take you, you can register and take you through the program. In addition to this, we have every month um, we run a series of programs inviting people to share deep insights about work ethics, how to even write your CVs and all that. You see, sometimes just talking, you need someone who has gone through the process to be able to help you really understand what you need to do. So we, we've had um, very insightful resource persons like um, the, the, the Ashesi uh, gentleman, Patrick. We have people like Patrick come on board. We have, we've had other industry CEOs, HR directors, entrepreneurs, just to share some insights. So you can go to our Facebook page after Ghana Facebook page and you will just query ready to work and there will be so much materials that you can listen to and get um, a lot of insights on how to prepare for the world of work. So when we talk about work skills, what are we talking about? So work skills is actually landing the job right for you and getting ready to land that job. Okay, how to get what you want by deciding what you want, okay, and making your CV work for you and interview the right way. So the, all these are the pre, before you go into the work, uh, before you even prepare to get the right job that you need. How have you positioned yourself for that? We've talked about how to have your digital footprint and all that. How are you positioning yourself well such that when the opportunity is given, I'm ready for it. I'm ready to grab it. So what skills deals with that? People skills, very important. And I, this is after what we came here. Usually, I would have our team come here earlier and then they would have set up uh, pull-ups, everything and all that but for some reason I think they came in and they dropped it off so when we came I had to do it myself with um, this gentleman a camera guy and I was doing it and I was seeing young people going up and down nobody even cared there was one gentleman though I noticed uh, is he still here yes thank you very much he came and said oh can I help you set it up and come on, if I was sitting on an interview panel and I see this gentleman, what do you think? He is caught already. I mean, for for showing so people skills very important, but some of us don't take that seriously. You go into a workplace, look, I go by people and no greeting. Well, you don't have to know me. We all work in the same environment. Even if I don't work, you meet someone, don't know what next would happen to you, how that person is going to help you. For example, probably that person is the person you need something from, and you don't know. So work, uh, people skills, very, very important. And now we have people with technical skills. Technical skills is very easy to get. When you come in, we, what, we are, what we are hiring for is not the technical skills. We are, we are looking for the attitude. Attitude is number one. So people skills, very important. And for us, where we work, you need people who are trustworthy, people who are honest, people who are courteous, because we're in a service industry and we're dealing with money. Money that you are seeing that you can't go into your pockets. You know, 
and you see the bundle of money and you look at your salary and you see the bundle of money and this thing has to go somewhere. You see, so we need people who can be trustworthy and all that. But not only for us. Every employer wants someone with the right attitude. Because as for the skills, everybody can learn. If you don't have the attitude, that, so people's skills, very important for you, money skills. Money is everything. You know, when, and I tell people, if I earn 5,000 and you earn 2,000 and at the end of the month, you are, you spend 1,000 and you are able to keep another 1,000 and I spend all my 5,000. I spend 4,000 and I leave 500. You are richer than me. You know that? And sometimes when we get into our first job, when the money starts coming, then we challenge the things you've been dreaming of buying whilst in school, the things you've been dreaming of doing. I have to spread myself small. See, money is very important because how you manage your money can determine the kind of life you would have. If you are able to manage your money comfortably, and even now, as a student, how you manage your money is able to help you manage whatever you get in the future. And if you want to really be successful, money, I mean, every, nothing is free. I remember, um, so this is just by the way, one of the editors was my classmate in school. So one day I went to him and I said, Charlie, um, I have some social responsibility activities and I want you to come and cover the thing for me for free. And he, then he looked at me and he said, Ah, Pastor, why do you want me to cover it for you? You don't want people to see it so they will know that you are doing this. I say yes. Ah, you want them to see it so that your business can thrive, right? I say yes. And you want me to come and do it for free. You bring something so that the business can also go on. Money is everything without money, yeah. but money, the, the role that money plays is very important in the things you want to do. Because if the money is not coming from you, it's coming from someone, or someone is sacrificing it for a time to make up for that money. Okay. So it's very important how you manage your money. So it deals also with money skills. And then lastly, entrepreneurial. Whether you work for yourself or you work for, a, for an organization, that organization is looking for people with an entrepreneurial spirit. Because if I'm giving you work to do, I'm expecting that you'll be managing it in a way that my business will be thriving. So even if you are not working for yourself, you need to still have that entrepreneurial mind. I need to be sure that if I leave my job for Kujo or Ama, you will be able to take care of the job and do it well. Because we are still, I work for a big organization and shareholders chase us for targets. If the shareholders pull out today and say, I'm no longer interested, and they pull out, the business collapse, I go home, I have no job. So even if you are working for someone, that entrepreneurial mindset is very important. So this is another pillar. So the four pillars, money skills, entrepreneurial skills, work skills, and people skills. Now very simple, I'm not asking you to do too much. I told you I don't waste that much of your time. Ready to work, if you go on your app now, whether you're using an Android or using an iPhone, just go on to Apple Store or Google Play right now and just download the Ready to Work app. So, I want to see you doing it now. You have phones, right? I want to see you doing that. Just do, go, go, go now and download the Ready to Work app and then register. We don't have much time. Other than that, what we would have done is we would have gone into groups and tried. We would have all gone through 
one of the models, just one lesson from the model, and then we have someone come share the learning from the page. Now. So you can download now, it's very important you do that to get all these skills for free. It's, it's free, it's free. And thank you. designed to bring together industry players to honor students on the need to develop a career for themselves before leaving school. The theme for the maiden edition is the career factor approaches to professional development. Shall we give it up for Joe? We've come to the end. Before we close, we'll take closing remarks from Her Excellency. classes for those who want to study outside the country. That's the GRE and then the SAT and then also the GMAT and IELTS as well. Um, we help students uh, with application processes, really not on a chart base in terms of conditions applied. Our sole interest in, is, is in helping students with um, the attrition part of the, the application, that's the GRE and the GMAT. But then over the years, you come to realize that there are challenges when it comes to studying abroad, when you want to apply to study outside the country. A lot of people do a lot of things wrong, and they get frustrated, they get locked up during the process. Now, um, I, don't know, I don't know if the um, behind are here. Okay. One advice I would want to give the behind is that, from now, if you know you want to study outside the country, if you know it's part of the plan to study outside the country after school, Start preparing now. Start sucking up your mind now. And be close to some of your lectures because you need them at the end of the day. We have people coming over after the class and then they read application. And they actually, okay, I've got into this part. The school is asking for um, a recommender. Like, okay, go back to your school, ask for a recommender. And then it becomes a problem. And now we don't understand why you've been in school for four years. And you're being asked to go for a recommendation from the school. And then it is a problem. It means when you're in school, you're not that close to your lectures. And I know most people like that. I don't know what it is um, with um, university students and then shying away from going to their lectures. You obviously need them one day. Otherwise, you get lectures who have templates of combination letters. And what they do is that, because they don't really know you that much, they can't really write a lot of things about you. What they do is that they just copy the templates, change their name, and then put your name there. So you can have people come from maybe the same department from the University of Ghana or maybe GIG, and then the combination letters can be the same. Also, I don't know why, but then a lot of people don't know how to write their CV. Start learning how to write a CV from now. There's something called a statement of purpose. You have people coming over to the office after the teaching process, you ask them to bring their statement of purpose and they ask you if you can write it for them. At Center for International Studies, the only thing we can do to help you is to um, copy and edit it for you. Like, um, after writing it, you try and check if it is okay. But then, 
you want to study outside the country, you should be able to write your own statement of purpose. I'm sure by now, most of you know what a statement of purpose is. Uh, purpose is. How many of you know what a statement of purpose is? <laughs> well, the question was, how many of you know what a statement of purpose is? Okay. So the statement of purpose is more like, a, some people call it a motivational letter, or a letter of intent. You know, so that's what I call it. It's more like um, the action to write about your, 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 life, uh, your ambitions after five years, the reason why you're choosing that particular course. Uh, you have a lot of topics. Sometimes they, like to, they let you write a general statement of purpose. And you should know, or you should know how to write a statement of purpose before you even think of applying to uh, study outside the country. Now, one important thing that I'll add is, if, you, if also if you know you want to study outside the country, please, before you even do anything at all, decide with your parents, or decide with your guide, or decide with whoever is going to fund that particular education for you. If you have your own money, that's, that's fine. But then decide with the parents. Also, um, the final year students. Um, do you have final year students here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So also, the final year students. You should know the type of examination you are going to write if you want to study outside the country. You should know the country you want to go to. You should know the type of examination you are going to write. Because these are some of the challenges that we face at um, CIS. And then we, did, we came up with this kind of um, annual program where we go to schools every year and try to educate them on some of these processes. We are not really interested in the application too much, like come and pay us money for us to do application for you. We do the more of the classes part. If I realize that a lot of people have challenges after going through all this process, paying money for classes and everything, and you don't have those little, little, little um, um, stuff, they end up getting stuck along the road and then they end up forfeiting the whole process. And then when you forfeit this kind of process, it means that you've wasted your money. And that is why, well, that's what you're trying to avoid at, at CIS. So, please. Um, also, I want to talk about uh, the visa application. If you want to stay outside the country, consider all these things I'm telling you. Visa application needs a lot of documents, especially as a student. One key document that always causes problems for students is what we call the bank statement. Please, don't go for a forged bank statement. It wouldn't help you, it wouldn't do you any good. You may be lucky, you may go through the process successfully, but it wouldn't do you any good at any point. Please, don't go for a forged bank statement. And then also, plan ahead. You know you want to stay outside the country, you have a lot of, a lot of years ahead of you. Plan ahead. You can, um, you can speak to your sponsor, you can start um, working on the bank statement, depositing money in the, in the, in the bank statement. At the right time you need it, per the quoted amount given by the school or um, um, after the scholarship or whatever it is, you know that this is a statement that you are taking to the embassy and it's a genuine one. The last one I'll touch on is um, transcript. Um, and this one goes to the level 100. Your transcript is very, 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 very important when it comes to study outside the country. It's very, very important in the sense that most of the, or the schools outside the country after your certificate, what they really look at is your transcripts, your track record when it comes to your academics. That's what they really, really look at in selecting students. So please, these are the little things that um, I'll put on board. We need really prepare to come here because we're actually working with the uh, um, senior high schools for now. And we heard about the program, I was like, okay, we're just going to talk to you guys. So within time, uh, we'll, we'll talk to the management and every time we'll come over with a proper presentation to come and talk to you about all these processes. Thank you. Give it out, give it out, can give it out. Give it out to you, uh, representing the CIS uh, here. So uh, now with a round of applause, we have come to the end, and I know a lot of us are waiting for item 13. Yes, definitely, I'm also waiting, guy. Yeah. Uh, so, let's, with a round of applause, let's welcome the Excellency, Fidelia Grand. Thank you. I will keep it short, short, short. I only have four points to make. Our first speaker spoke about the language. He says, whenever you are in a media, even if you're not a journalist, even if you're a teacher, whoever you are, 
a uh, uh, housekeeper name it. Whenever you use a word, make sure you know what you are saying. Make sure you know what you communicate to others. And to pronounce it, if you're not an English speaking person, just tell them they will know that you don't have to pronounce it as a Ghanaian pronounce it, but as your country pronounce it. That's the best, that is you. And the other thing is that what he put emphasis on, and that is real life, prepare, be prepared for the job. Be prepared for what you don't know. That will make you be successful. Don't be like, well, I'm going to be a journalist, so these are the only skills I need. You need all these skills to be a good journalist because you don't know if you will work with the president of the country once. You will be the man of the news, but you need the skills also to help the president be a good president. It's all upon you. So being a journalist is a very important thing. And brand yourself not someone else. Don't want to be someone else. Be you. There's only one unique you. There's only one unique skill in you that everybody else will take, uh, uh, will take from where they are to build themselves up to be themselves as well. And the last uh, statement that I love the most Start and sustain and network. Networking is very unique. We have a word for network in my in my language, which is ahala. Ahala. And when you are an ahala, meaning you support others, and the person you support supports someone else. And that someone else supports another, and we support the whole country. So all of us are ahalas, right? We are networkers. And when we network, meaning we leave something behind for someone, maybe sometimes they don't know you're a networker, you're a networker, sometimes they don't know you're their ahala. But when they go back, even when your father doesn't want you to go to school or do certain type of study, he's your ahala. Because he makes you think of it better. You want him to see you succeed in what you want. It should not be, maybe not your father, maybe your mother, your brother, your sister, an auntie, name it. Whoever it might be, be who you are and be the best. Uh, out of what you want to be. And uh, I want to advise you not be ambassadors will give you the visa. It's the consular affairs. So they have special offices where you can go in my country. You can go to the website where they look for a visa. You don't need a tourist visa. But other visas, if you want to go and study there, you can go to the website of our consular affairs and you will find it. It's a small nation, but you can still come and do an internship in our country. We have a lot of things uh, similar, gold mining, artisanal gold mining. I hear you call them galaxy. We call them Ukamma. Yes, it's small scale, but they have a nickname for that, right? And the nickname, illegal, that's what I'm talking about. We have illegal people there as well, in the gold field. So it, we, that's the problem for the governments of the people. So we share same problems. What I want to say, keep the good job. The fact that you're here is a success. You are a great woman, you are a great man, not only those who stand in front of you as uh, uh, um, 
as a role model for you, but you yourself, you're a role model for yourself as well. Think big and you'll be, don't think small. But don't think you're more important than anyone else. All of us are important and we can equally be an ahala to everybody else. Thank you for having me and God bless you. I have a book here, right? It is when you want to come to my country and you want to know all the languages you speak, it's only five here. So you have Okanisi, they, they wrote Okans. You have Sranatom of Dutch, English, and French. So it is, if you're interested, you can call the embassy and we might provide you with one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Her Excellency Victoria Grand Dalong, uh, the ambassador for Suriname. Uh, in uh, Southern America. All right, so we have come to the end of the program. And uh, one thing I think is be your, you know, be a hala, uh, be a hala. Let us all be a halas, and uh, we will be able to connect from, uh, we connect dots to, to become what? To make lines, is that okay? Yes, so as I'm seeing you today, make sure you are my dot, my next dot to connect. And if it's, as you are seeing me here, uh, I, also, I also have to make sure you are my next dot, so that when you connect with me, then we will make what? A line of progress. Is that okay? Uh, yes, there is one important announcement. One. We will be taking a group picture. But as you're seated, uh, Aina for uh, Aina is sharing food. Uh, yes, I, oh, sorry, not food. Item 30. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk about food, I am talking about food, I blend, bamboo, and the rest. Yes, so Aina is, uh, and uh, his team, sorry, Aina and her team, they are sharing item 13, at least for us to eat it. You can take us home. Before we get the fufu and the bamboo and the rest, uh, do not forget to subscribe to Authentic News. Authentic News, uh, our brother here, News Room, Akpa, and News Room. Yeah. Right? Authentic News, uh, and the channel name is News Room. Authentic uh, on, News Room. Authentic News Room. For uh, that is for Mr. Akpa. Uh, he's the owner of that particular channel, and uh, he's been doing so well. He's a student of the, of the Ghana Institute of Journalism and the level 300. But so far, so good. You know, when you check his website, his YouTube page, you see some beautiful stuff there. Yes, so now we will be taking a group picture. As we take a group picture with uh, our guests and guests, unfortunately, the minister is still not here. Uh, but then we have communicated to him that the program is almost all we are, we are done. And so he has to carry other national duties. Please, photographers, help us take. Yes, uh, the organizers first. Organizers of the program, please come. Organizers of the program, join the guys to take the picture. Organizers. Without thanking Absa Bank. Absa Bank, thank you so much for sponsoring and thank you so much for providing your service for us. Organizers.
Okay, everyone, let me have your attention. I'm going to raise the watches. 